Hello and welcome to the Ashland Select Board meeting for October 21st, starting at 6 p.m. Pursuant to the laws and uh, verdicts and edicts that were passed by Governor Baker, we are still working all via Zoom. I am going to do a roll call vote just to let you know that we are all here. Mitchell? Here. Mignani? Here. Shear? Here. And Kinsman? Here and Greaves here. Uh, we also have uh, Susan Roby and Jen Ball. Michael Herbert, our town manager, will be joining us a little bit later. Um, I'm going to open it up for citizens' participation. Um, not seeing too many citizens yet, but if there's anyone who would like to comment, I'm going to give Mark another second because he just got on. Mark, did you want to participate in citizens' participation? All good. Okay. Um, I would like to like to thanks say good evening to all involved that's on this board, including the other people that are there, including to our business queen there, Beth. I I would like to ask a question. I was on the board of health last night. Is the town manager, other than Jen Ball, is the town manager Michael going to be on tonight? He is. He's going to just, he just needs to come on a little bit later, probably around seven or so. Okay. So uh, I want to, I want to say, I know there's two agenda items that hopefully will have some progress. One of them is going to be the, uh, the mill building, the 50 Main Street. Yeah. And the town manager is going to be talking about uh, the COVID Halloween. Yes, when he comes. So I don't know. I, I'm expecting him to be back by the time we do Rich Gordon, or at least as we finish that up. And then, of course, he'll be giving his reports at the end of the night. Okay, so I, I would like to say I was on the Board of Health and we had a good discussion about Halloween and how COVID and what to do and how to guard against and everything. Okay. I've mentioned on there, I'll say it again tonight here for you. I've been 64 years old on Halloween night, so I want to make sure that Halloween is going to be a good, uneventful, but healthy gatherings for all involved. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome, Mark, and an early happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Um, we do have a appointment at 615, um, but it is only 603. I'm not seeing too many other residents to see if anyone else wants to participate in citizens participation. We can't start that early. Um, let us go. Minutes. I was just going to say, let's go to the consent agenda. Yeah. We want to, uh, so we have on our consent agenda for the evening, the approval of regular session minutes for October 7th, 2020 and minutes from the May 26th, 2020 scholarship committee meeting. Uh, we have Declare Surplus American International Electronic Impulse Sealer Model MP12 and accept the donation in the amount of $150 for animal adoption for Susan Little. If I can get a motion to approve the consent agenda. Approve as uh, consent agenda as presented. Thank you. And a second? Second. Okay, we got three seconds. Pick one, Susan. Um, <laughs> And we'll do roll call votes starting alphabetically. Kinsman. Aye. Mignani. Aye. Mitchell. Shear. Aye. And Greaves. Aye. That passes 5 0 uh, as presented. Um, we are going to go, we still have about 10 minutes. We're going to jump down to because Beth Reynolds is here. Um, we are going, and I think this should be in enough time, to discuss and approve the recommendation from our town manager and economic development director, uh, two items from the business incentive program grants. Beth, if you're ready, um, if you go ahead and present and you are still muted. There you go. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I have um, submitted uh, the applications from two businesses in town. It has gone through the business, um, the economic development advisory group. Um, they've looked at all the applications. The two applicants have actually met all of the 
requirements through the incentive program. And then um, we have sent that up to uh, Michael and you uh, for a review of that. One of them being Madras Market. It is the owner of the Dosa Temple that was in business. <laughs> Um, but has now pivoted due to the pandemic. Um, so we'll be opening an Indian market um, with specialty spices and ready to eat meals, um, a, a big array of things. It will be actually, I think, well received in our community. Um, there's a need for it, uh, for sure. He's done market analysis um, and I think it will be very successful. The second is Adoragon Ramen, who is now expanding his business, again, pivoting, changing his indoor dining experience into Doragon provisions. So now his business will have a three part, um, three parts. So it'll be Doragon Ramen, bubble tea and provisions. Um, so he's really trying to expand his business. Um, and we felt as though this um, grant would help him to do that. Um, so again, both of them have gone through the process and now they're in your hands. Great. Questions from anybody? Um, yeah, Rob? sorry, Beth, I, I missed, what was the, what's the, the first, um, the first um, market? What, what is the business he's going into or she? So it's um, Madras Market is going to be the name of actually where Dosa Temple is, so, or was. Yeah. So he's now just gutted the entire, um, that entire space and has created um, just a beautiful market, um, a new HVAC system, new floors. Um, and he's applied for the amenities financing program um, in order to cover, help cover the cost of the freezers and the refrigerators. He's um, actually investing over $250,000 um, to make this happen. And in that space, I think it's a great investment in Ashland. Um, that whole plaza is just really blown up with some great businesses, even this month. Um, so that is his plan. He did keep okay. the kitchen. I should say that too, Rob, he did keep the kitchen. Um, so he's hoping um, as, as it sort of goes, um, gets rolling here that he can, you know, do still do some takeout and ready to eat meals. Cool. Okay. Okay. Questions, anybody else? Comments, anybody else? Sounds like, as Beth said, uh, that plaza is really kind of taken on a new life with mm -hmm. new businesses there. So, uh, so good luck to all of them, uh, you know, and it's just, it's, just fascinating that this is taking place in the middle of, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic and the, you know, the economic uh, issues that we're dealing with. So, you know, good luck and welcome to Ashland. Brandy, you had a comment or question? So I just, I just wanted to say um, that, you know, looking at, looking at how businesses can pivot during this time, it's, it's, it's great. And the fact that we have this business incentive program that can help with some of the financial burden of doing that, I think is, is great. So this is something that I definitely support. Good, yeah, I, I would agree. First of all, Beth, thank you for bringing them forward to us. I think to see our businesses still being able to and willing to invest, because it's not just the, the incentive money that they're using, but they're using their own funds to show that they want to invest here in Ashland. And as we said, there's a, a new smoothie place there i i'm still i still have to go check it out but they've been doing well since they opened um yeah it's nice to see yeah and i and i think beth you have a lot to do with that with businesses willing to stay here in ashland and invest in ashland so thank you for bringing programs like this forward and and supporting and supporting the business owners Okay, uh, with that, we have these two programs in front of us. If I can get a motion to support and approve these two grants and loans as presented. So moved. And a second, please. Second. Okay, uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Kinsman? Aye. Mignani? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Shear? Did Rob go away? We lost Rob. Yeah, it looks like he fell off. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> Hope he didn't fall off his bed. <laughs> Here he comes. There he is. He's back. He switched yeah, locations. Yeah, so I just lost my connection for a while. I had to move. Okay. Uh, Rob, we have a motion and a second for the two uh, grant pro grant applications. Um, and I was just taking a vote. Sure. So, Sheer, 
Okay. Aye. And Greaves, aye. Great. That passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Okay, we're going to go back now because it is about 6.15. I'm going to scroll back through my documents. Just give me a second. And I'm going to read. Do we have someone from NSTAR? Do we think that's who has called in, Susan? Yes, okay. Legal notice for the town of Ashland. Notice is hereby given that the select board will conduct a hearing for a grant of location requested by NSTAR Electric Company, DBA Eversource Energy and Verizon New England Inc. for the purpose of obtaining a grant of location to install one new pole 34 slash 23A located in front of 311, 311 Pleasant Street in Ashland. A public hearing will be held on Wednesday, October 21st, 2020 using Zoom. Meeting information will be posted on the agenda, which can be found on the town website, www.ashlandmass.com. The hearing will take place at 6.15 p.m. Persons wishing to be heard on this matter are invited to attend the public hearing by logging into the Zoom meeting. Interested parties who are unable to attend the hearing may submit written comments to the select board's office, Town Hall 101 Main Street, Ashland Mass, or by emailing Susan Roby at sroby at ashlandmass.com, signed Yolanda Greaves, chair of the select board. So, and who do we have on the phone from NSTAR? Hi, yes, um, good evening. This is Christine Crosby from Eversource Energy. Hi, Christine. And I'm, uh, hi. Hi. Go we ahead. are requesting permission to install a new pole, pole 34 over 23A on Pleasant <clears throat> Street. And the purpose of the new pole would be to provide um, electric service to a, the, the solar project that's um, Oh, good. You're going to, the solar project located at 311 Pleasant Street. Okay. I'm trying to. Any questions, comments from the board regarding this? Want to share the, uh, the. Yes, I can share the picture. Share screen. Three and share. Okay, I should be sharing. Just can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So three eleven Pleasant Street, Metro West facilities. That looks like the DFW. Yeah. So three eleven. Yes. It's the. It's, yeah, it's located at. at in front of the VFW. Okay. So is this a private project that's being done for the VFW or is this another entity for the solar? Actually, to be, I'm not really sure, to be honest with you, um, because it seems like there's other projects that have taken place at, at other facilities like this, um, VFWs or uh, veterans hall. So that's something that I, 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 I can look into and get back to you. Well, I'm, I, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I'm rather curious as to if this is a private entity that's they're leasing out space. I wonder if they've had any uh, discussions with CONCOM and uh, planning and zoning board and stuff to go over the, the, this project, or is it going to be on the building itself? Well, I mean, I don't know, but I think at, at this point, our question is just, do we want to approve the placement of a poll on the sidewalk, because I take it this is not a temporary pole. This is going to be a permanent pole. Is that correct, Christine? Yes, it would be a permanent pole being placed within the public way, and then from that uh, from that pole, it would be an underground service to um, a pad mount transformer that would be that, that would be located at the property at three eleven Pleasant. Okay. Okay. So it'll be connecting to the grid up above, but to the property down below. Yes. Okay. And uh, so the, 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 the pole, the 3425 would not work for that? Um, 34 over 25, mm -hmm. no. Okay. Okay. 
Any other questions from the board? My only question is is, is relative to to uh, Joe's question is is what is actually being done there? Is it is it a ground mounted system? Is it a a roof mounted system? Uh, you know the the idea that there's a, a pad mount transformer indicates you know something that's a little that's somewhat more sizable than let's say just a rooftop unit. And I'm not suggesting that we not approve this, but I think it's, uh, you know, that that really would be my question is what is it really hooking into? Jen or Susan, do either of you have that information or? No. Have that information? Um, Susan, did, did you have that? I do not, but usually anything having to do with solar panels does not come through us. It goes right. through inspection services. So I don't know that we would have that. Okay. It sounds though like we're interested. I think um, to people's point, you mean this is our purview, so it's on the public way. So that's what we have to approve. It would be good in future if there is an issue like this to know what's being connected. Um, but I think at this point, you know, if we can get that after the fact, that'd be good to find out. Okay. okay, I'm actually, I'm actually trying to look it up okay. right now. Um, if you could just bear with me for sure. a minute. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> Not a problem. I just, if I just want to see if there's any information here on the um, computer that I can look up. Um, okay. And is there anyone other than Christine? Is there anyone here to speak for or against? this item. Mark, is it just a question? Okay, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question while we wait for the information. Okay, thank you. Again, Mark Sony. And um, what I think is down there, is that single, single family house by the VFW in the Marathon Park? No, that's not this, Mark. This is directly in front of the VFW. VFW. So it's the parking lot of the VFW then? Yeah. It's in front of that. It's actually, yeah. Actually, I just looked it up, and it, it is a solar array ground mount system. And um, I believe it's going to be like in the rear of the property. Wow. Out and back. I, okay. Okay. Again, that's some, you know, that's probably conservation or planning. We'll have to review that. Yeah, I'm not quite positive that that's the case, but I will certainly check into it and get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Great. I'm wondering, given that information uh, and not knowing all the other particulars, should we, uh, you know, approve this just conditional with the, you know, the, the uh, successful um, process through the whatever planning board slash concom uh, process? That makes sense, right? Because we want to make sure they go through the correct processes, other than just us, for the board for the poll. Okay. Okay. If there is no one else to talk for this or against it, if I can get a motion to close the hearing. So moved. And a second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. The hearing is closed, and now if I can get a motion to approve this poll conditionally with the process of going through the other boards as necessary. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, because this is a vote on that, I will do this via um, roll call. Kinsman. Aye. Uh, Mignani. Aye. Mitchell. Aye. Shear. Aye. And Greaves, aye. That does pass 5-0, but just so that you know, Christine, conditional that making sure that all the other processes that may need to happen for the solar to go in need to happen before the poll is approved. Okay, and what, what the, what's those particular boards? I probably the planning board and maybe conservation, depending on where they want to put the solar. Okay. Conservation, okay. 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 Yes, thank you. Great, and I'll, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll try to get back to you to let you know. 
Yeah, if you could let us know, we'd appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now. And thank you. You're welcome, Christine. Thank you. Okay. Next item on our agenda, we have an appointment at seven o'clock. Uh, we're going to go down to old and new business. We're going to start with discuss and vote providing funds for a grab and go lunch for the seniors from the select board's gift account. Steve, I'm going to let you do this one. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Yolanda. So this is really to support a uh, uh, lunch on veterans day uh, for the senior community. Right now they're been doing a weekly uh, grab and go, as it says, drive by lunch, about 35 seniors to 40 seniors are taking, taking advantage of it. Uh, they pay about $4 uh, and the, the balance is subsidized by uh, the Friends of the Council on Aging. Uh, uh, I've been helping out, participating in the, uh, in, in the program uh, and it's been, it's been really good. It gets a lot of seniors out that normally wouldn't even get out during the course of the day I get to see uh, Rob's uh, mother-in-law on a regular basis, and uh, but uh, I think it would be nice if we participated uh, and uh, offer a, a free lunch uh, on behalf of the uh, the select board uh, for an amount not to exceed five hundred dollars. We'd anticipate about fifty uh, about fifty uh, seniors going. It would uh, the cost. Uh, of each meal is about seven dollars plus they we wind up buying a dessert as well so not to exceed a five hundred dollar amount should more than cover this this request okay so okay. move <laughs> <laughs> if i can get a second a second okay any other discussion i think it's a great project great yeah. idea yeah, I think any way that we can keep our seniors engaged and supporting them through through everything that's going on, and we don't, you know, you so you what so it will be what day, Steve? Veterans Day, uh, whatever that falls on, it'll be that Monday of of, of Veteran Day, yeah, nice. Veterans Day week. But it's it be advertised as a, as a Veterans Day free lunch, compliments of the select board. Okay, would it be good for some of us to be there to? help hand stuff out or not? It, it's, you know, I'll check, uh, you know, uh, next week when I'm there on Monday, I'll check. I don't, okay. get, I don't see why not, but okay. uh, let me check with, you know, what we do is we get a delivery of food. It, everything gets packaged in a, in a uh, uh, bag. supermarket bag uh, and it gets handed out this week. We handed out the lunch. We handed out a pumpkin. Uh, there was some other additional uh, goodies. So, you know, it's that kind of thing, but things need to be packaged and, and okay. yeah. Yeah, let so, us know if they need some help and maybe some of us can. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I just wanted to also make note that, uh, you know, one of one of the seniors that passed through, uh, Rosie Pimentel turned 91 this past uh, Monday. So happy birthday to Josie and- uh, Definitely happy birthday. <laughs> So Steve, that Veterans Day week because Veterans Day falls on a Wednesday. So it'll be that Monday. Okay. But it'll be advertised as a Veterans Day free lunch. Lunch compliments of the select board. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think we had a motion. We had a second. We had a discussion. Uh, Kinsman. Aye. Mignani. Aye. Mitchell. Aye. Shear. Aye. And Greaves. Aye. And that passes five zero. Steve, thank you for bringing that forward. I would say to other members, if if there's things like that that you're hearing about that we can help support the community, I think you know let's let's keep doing that as we can. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Next item in our agenda is uh, we were asked. Uh, it was recommended, and we thought it would be a good idea to write a letter to Secretary Pollock regarding the I-90 interchange and some of the things they want to do. I'm gonna share my screen again. This time it's gonna be that one. So this is the letter. 
we'll make it a little bit bigger. We'll start at the top. Um, I know you've all read it. I'm going to read it as quickly as I can. Thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts and concerns regarding I-90 Alston multimodal project and the impact it will have on our residents and businesses. We feel it is imperative to maintain the current number of travel lanes in each direction on I-90. The final project should not reduce the capacity of the Massachusetts Turnpike at any location. I-90 remains an intensely utilized roadway with approximately 150,000 car trips per day in the throat area. Temporary lane reductions during construction should be strategically planned out to minimize traffic disruption. And the message needs to be communicated effectively to minimize the impact to the public. Maintaining the commuter rail service on the Framingham Worcester line is vital to the Metro West area. The Framingham Worcester line connects the two largest cities in New England and prior to COVID-19 had seen the sharpest increase in ridership of any commuter rail line with ridership rising 46% between 2012 and 2018. The potential to reduce service to a single track during construction could substantially increase commuting times and discourage ridership. Disruption in rail service would create a ripple down effect by putting commuters back onto I-90 in single occupancy vehicles. We request that you pursue mitigation strategies that expand commuter opportunities. Your thoughtful and comprehensive strategic planning should be put in place prior to construction that specifically consider the needs of commuters accessing Boston from the West and accessing the West from Boston area. Potential recommendation could include enhancing park and ride lots, providing additional bus and or shuttle, shuttle service, incentivizing public transportation, carpooling, and engaging the business community to encourage employers to offer more flexible work schedules. Analyzing total, tolling equity must be considered in project funding. I-90 remains the only tolled roadway across the state and increasing tolls to fund the project would further burden a segment of commuters who have historically been asked to make contributions that users of other major roadways do not. We thank you for your consideration. Please let us know if we can provide any further information. If so, please contact us at selectboard at ashlandmass.com sincerely and we'll see you see. So that is the uh, proposed letter. Uh, does anybody have any tweaks or changes they'd like to see to it? Could I just could I just give a little bit of background on this for folks that may not be really familiar with the project? Sure. Um, I attended last night the the uh, Alston Multimodal Project update and public comment um, public forum. They so this project basically has been in the works since 2014, and anyone that's traveled into Boston via the Pike um, knows kind of the the, uh, the stretch that they're referring to as the throat, which is where the Mass Pike and Soldiers Field Road and the commuter rail kind of all come in together over what is um, what is the, the the viaduct, so the overpass uh, for the Mass Pike. And so that's kind of really the, the catalyst for this is that they found that the, the viaduct is, is deficient and is sort of at its end of its, of its useful life. Um, so what they're proposing is um, a project that basically straightens out the mass pike and um, changes the, the flow of traffic on Soldier's Field Road, also gives more um, uh, pedestrian and bike friendly options to get to the Charles River. Um, and if, you know, and, the, and then also it affects the commuter rail as well as, as we were talking. So this project is um, still in its public comment period. They're looking to do uh, about two years of permitting. And then this project is actually, they're, they're expecting six to eight years of construction. Um, costing a, an estimate of somewhere between 1.3 and 1.6 billion dollars. And that doesn't even, I don't think, include the building of a new train station because when they straighten out the, the, um, the Mass Pike, the area that is now currently the, um, the, um, the sort of the railway um, train like- old, The old rail yard there. Yeah, the rail yard there. Um, they're going to they're going to develop that, and they're going to put in a new station called West Station, and they're also going to um, create that as sort of like a transportation hub 
and so so it's it's kind of a big project there are all this this will affect not only the mass pike but it will uh, affect the commuter rail they're looking to put the you know they're trying to minimize the impact they say they're trying to minimize the impact um but there will be a stretch of time where the commuter rail will be down to one track um and they are promising that they will have three lanes of traffic on the mass pike open at all times so that's that's what they're they're um, stating, but I think that this this letter that that um, that was drafted is 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 a really good statement because for Metro West we're really sort of disproportionately affected by by this. So you know this project they're they're looking twenty years down the future. They're trying to figure out ways to to be able to better handle the the traffic, even though they're not technically widening the the Mass Pike or adding um, more, you know, train tracks per se, but, um, they are looking to, to start this project. You know, the construction is probably going to start in say 2023. And it, it, this will, this will be a long project. This will be something that Metro West commuters will be, will be looking at for, for 10 years. So, um, so I think that, that, you know, not only should we send this letter to secretary Pollack, but we should also, um, send it to the official because we are in a comment, they are in a comment period for the project um, to also sort of CC that, that um, the project uh, group as well, because yep. I think that that's important. Yep. So for people that are watching and listening, you can get more information, mass.gov backslash Alston, Alston slash multimodal slash project. And it will take you through the information and, and let you see what they're planning to do. Yeah. Um, right, right now, they're looking at three main options for this throat area. Um, the different ones impact things like there's, there's one option that um, creates a, a temporary trestle over the, uh, the Charles River. So there's definitely different impacts depending on whether it's um, they basically do a modified um, um, viaduct like they currently have and or whether they put everything at grade. Um, you, you know, I, I think it's it's a matter of um, and there's there's just a tremendous amount of impact to the entire area. So it's um, it's a big project. What's crazy is they just did bridge work just past this. Right. As you go past BU, there was some, you know, as the as the pike went goes back down, going across, I think it was not Mass Ave, but one of the other ones, they just did major bridge work and they spent money on that. So um, but this is being driven by the new landowners of that old rail yard, um, wanting to change some different things. So yeah, so that we can we can send this as well. Uh, I also have uh, a Metro West Regional Collaborative meeting tomorrow, and I'm going to encourage the collaborative to send a letter and then also each of the communities that are affected by it. So no comments or changes? Oh, I do. I did have a, um, well, my comment is I think this is a, a, a very well done letter. And, you know, I think we're all aware of the importance of this project, and we've been kind of monitoring it from afar for last at least a year or more. So um, I'm glad that least. we're getting directly involved and putting in our comments. And I think, um, who did Brandy, did you write the letter or who, who came up with this? No, I, I, I don't know if it was Michael or oh. I know he's been working with um, Senate President Spilka because she's been an advocate okay. Okay. for this as well, so. Yeah, and uh, the uh, just a question about some of those commuter enhancements and like one of the last paragraphs about uh, what's the purpose of that? Is this like during construction to give people other ways of getting without using commuter rail or what's the purpose of that uh, as far mm -hmm. as we know? I mean, it, it all looks good to me. I'm just wondering exactly how it would fit in with this process. I think part of it is so that they understand that they can't impact negatively the people that are commuting from the west through that area right i'm just looking at the in, enhancing park and ride lots providing additional bus i guess that's all measures to take during construction if i'm understanding it correctly right i would say okay. if for some reason they have to limit the commuter rail for some reason that they make sure they enhance with extra buses right. and or give extra park and ride lots along the way so that you can 
commute together and, and minimize the number of cars coming through. Curve. So uh, yeah, and my only other um, just observation is, as, as Brandy, I think mentioned, there's a number of uh, proposals under under consideration about how to actually replace that viaduct and a viaduct and how much they're going to do to fix the pipe versus all the other, um, you know, like uh, whether it should be ground level or it should continue to be elevated. And I don't know if we, I frankly don't know enough about the impact of those different alternatives as to how it might impact our concerns about um, minimizing commuter disruption. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Or I, I understand that Secretary Pollack is, needs to make a very important decision pretty quickly about, and they have not come apparently to some kind of consensus about how to actually, the best way to do this project. So I don't know if anybody had any insight uh, on that particular part of it. My understanding, I did not, and then I'll let you go, Brandy. I did not, was, wasn't able to attend the update last night because I had a Mendez building. But the other times that I've seen different, you know, seen them review their proposals, part of what they're trying to determine is cost, right? If between moving it over and determining what goes under and what goes above could affect the cost in regards to, okay, Sturrow Drive is only two lanes. Would it be better to have that up and the Mass Pike is three lanes, better to have that down or is it vice versa? And then also in regards to the new train station and how that station could impact people to get to it and a bus station. And they're looking at different options as to what is the, you know, the layering of the train station versus road and a bus station. And I think those are the different impacts and aspects that they're looking at. And, and I, I just don't know and I think this letter is great because it reminds them of, you know, things they should be aware of as they go through this project. And I'm right. just wondering if there's any particular design that would affect us more or less, and maybe that's not so, possible to really know. But so I would say, I because they were going through the three options last night, and there's actually a really good analysis matrix that they have up. It's kind of hard to find. I can, I can um, send you guys the. The, the link to it if you would like to take a look, but it really is is more focused on, I mean, the, the, from a construction standpoint and an impact standpoint for for commuters, it's pretty much the same across the board. Yeah. There's still, there's, there's not any option that is going to um, keep four lanes of traffic open on the Mass Pike at all times. And there's no um, option that would, um, have the, the commuter rail not be impacted and not have to go down to a single track at some point. There's different stages of, of construction, um, but you know a lot of the impact is based on, um, on things like environmental, um, things like impact to the river and to utilities and what would be most um, from, from, a, from a construction standpoint more problematic for, for for the team to, to work around. So I think it's going to be, and there's also like, you know, there's there's one option that's more resilient from a like flood flood stage right. perspective, because there's one, you know, if, if you're at if you're at grade and there's parts that are below grade and there's a hundred year flood, you know, there's there's gonna be problems. So I think they're gonna be taking those types of things under consideration. Yeah, very complicated project. Yeah. But it's okay, well, thank you. But, yeah, but the impact is pr pretty much the same across the board okay. for, from our perspective. Yeah, so as I said, if you go to the Alston multimodal project, there's one or two steps and I'm looking at a, a one of the maps. So okay. take it to, you know, I, I don't know, Rob, though, if, I mean, certainly I think if we each, if there's something we think would be better, but I think the mm -hmm. importance and the impact for this letter is to remind them that it's great that they want to do this for that area, but remember the people that are still trying to get to work exactly. and trying to commute in and out of Boston on a daily basis and let's impact them as little as possible. I think that's the big thing. Right. Okay. Madam Chair, is there any uh, potential of having some of the uh, Metro West area communities 
all sign a letter uh, of support yep. with respect to that? So as I said, I have a Metro West Regional Collaborative meeting tomorrow morning, which is Ashland, Holliston, Framingham, Natick, Wayland, Wellesley, Southboro, Marlboro, and Weston. And I'm going to be presenting our letter, and I'm sure we'll write something similar and just update it to represent those nine communities. And then I'm also going to recommend each of those communities get their board, uh, select boards to, to send in a letter as well. So Thank you. There'll be, some, there'll be some strength in numbers letting them know the impact. Thank you. The nice thing about being involved in regional things. <laughs> OK. Um, Unless someone feels we need a motion, I think we can just go ahead and uh, get this sent. We will uh, also CC the um, mass dot directly, the not mass dot because it's going to Secretary Pollock, but the the location for um, comments. So we'll get that done. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this. It is 642. What else is on our agenda that we can do? Yolanda, I mean, we can we could do the um, liquor license fees if you wanted to. If you thought, sure. Obviously, we have Beth here. Um, yep. I should have done that first. I'm. I apologize, Beth. Yeah, that's fine. So I can. <laughs> um, so obviously, um, I think we discussed last at our last meeting, um, sort of extending the opportunity to have outdoor dining through uh, the end of the calendar year, as was extended by Governor Baker. Um, Beth has been doing a really great job sort of reaching out to all businesses to sort of determine what's the biggest struggle. Um, obviously looking ahead for restaurants um, while they're able to keep outdoor dining, and I think they're being really creative on how they can possibly do that. There's certainly going to be a limit of um, the number of people who will partake in outdoor dining straight through December. Obviously it's, you know, we live in Massachusetts, it's going to get cold. Um, and a, a driver of their profit is alcohol sales. And so there's been some discussion um, amongst uh, the local economic development directors on, you know, what, what are some of the things that we may be able to do at a local level? Um, as you know, Beth, and, and the town of Ashland is a lead on the micro enterprise grant for businesses. And so there are some state and local opportunities, but what we're finding is that they are incredibly restrictive. And so m much less of our businesses are eligible than we had uh, anticipated. And so, you know, it's sort of important to sort of think about, you know, are there ways that we can um, help support and advocate for our businesses so that they make it through uh, this pandemic and make it through the winter, which I think for restaurants um, is going to be particularly difficult. Um, and so um, Beth sort of did an analysis of what the liquor license fees are. Um, she sat down with the director of finance, Brittany, um, and we can actually absorb um, the fees if we eat if we waived 100% of the fees for this year. And so, you know, for us, as you, I think you guys have the analysis, you know, it total, it totals uh, a little over $28,000 for, for all of the fees. And so, you know, that's not a huge piece of obviously our operating budget, but individually for those businesses, it is a significant, um, you know, assistance um, with their sort of bottom line. And so, um, you know, we wanted to, I, I, we presented three options um, but I did want to let you know that, you know, if, if agreed upon, we can actually absorb the 100%. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Okay, I'm now screen sharing the information that Beth uh, created for us. Um, let's open it up for questions from the board regarding this. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so Beth, is this for the remainder? So it's like basically fourth quarter 2020 and all of 2021, we'd be waiving these fees? Is that what this is? So liquor license renewal renewals are, are, are all of our um, license fees are actually up for renewal now. So we actually okay. are sending out our renewal letters now and it's for, so it will be for all of next year. All of next year. Okay. All right. That, that's good. And so I know that, um, that, you know, the analysis was sort of, there were a couple parts to this analysis. There was this, which Yolanda's show, showing, there was a breakdown of all the fees in, in town. And I just wanted to clarify that we're really only looking to waive the fees for 
for the restaurants, correct? Yes, at this time, um, I mean, the other fees are really the $50 common VIC license. You know, that's not too much of an impact um, to the businesses, but these liquor licenses with the, um, the amounts that they are it would really actually help. And uh, the, the other thing we sort of looked at is that it's it's likely going to be the most in, in, impacted by the sort of change in season and mm -hmm. the pandemic. And so it's also a big driver of their overall, um, their, their profitability and sort of ability to stay afloat during during COVID. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I, I know I've had a conversation with Beth about the, the, the micro enterprise grants and, and I know that there are major restrictions. So there were a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of our businesses couldn't take, take advantage of that. So I, you know, I'm, I'm personally, you know, I, I think it's a, I think if we can, if from our operating budget, if it's not a, um, if it doesn't impact the town in a, negative way from our budget perspective and we're able to absorb this, I think this is something that we can, one of those levers that we can do to really help our businesses. So um, I would definitely support this. Okay. Uh, just a clarification. So um, I didn't understand, Beth, your response about what year this, when you said next year, do you mean FY22? Yep, so it's January. So it'll, it's, so it, I, it's calendar year. Yeah, uh, these are on the calendar year, Rob, not okay, the fiscal but year. So it has to go into a town fiscal year. So that would be half, half of, of 21 and half of 22. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, I think this seems reasonable uh, thing to do. Okay. Steve or Joe? Yeah, no, absolutely supportive of this. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've certainly demonstrated, uh, you know, the need to support uh, particularly the restaurants, uh, they have unique challenges uh, uh, that other businesses don't have. So I think uh, you know, this is a small thing we can do and I'm certainly in favor of this. Okay. Madam Chair, I, I agree with my other uh, board members. I think that it's uh, very important uh, to uh, help those that uh, have helped a lot of us over the years. Uh, and you know, a lot of these restaurants have been very supportive for uh, public donations all the time and requests from, you know, different groups within, within the community. And I think it's time that we step up and help them out that way as well. Well said, Joe. Yes. So um, before we get a motion and a vote, so Beth, how is it that they can't participate or um, use the enterprise grant? What are some of the restrictions that they're dealing with? So the micro enterprise grant is a, federal and state grant that is based around small businesses. So they have to have five employees or less, and they have to hit a threshold for LMI, low to median income. Okay. Um, so in the Ashland area and the Cambridge area, that's where we fall. Um, it's based on where the business owner lives, not works. They have to work in one of the 23 communities um, or have their business there, but they can live in other places. So the LMI is based on where they live. Um, typically, an, the LMI is 96000 a year for a household income. So between the five employees or less, um, which could be part-time employees as well as full-time employees, and the, meeting the threshold for the LMI, it's really bumping a lot of biz, small businesses out that we thought might um, it might help. Um, you also have to be in business as of January 2019. And Ashland saw a lot of new businesses come into town after that. So um, they also are bumped out of this as well. Um, so we're, we're, you know, there will be more grants coming um, I, that I you know, have heard of. Um, so, you know, there will be some funding, but again, it's, it's not, um, I don't believe it's going to help the, the restaurants, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so that's why we're looking at this more on a local level. Um, other uh, um, economic development directors that I'm in constant contact with, um, you know, we've all kind of been talking about different ideas, you know, outdoor dining and um, things like this. So we're all trying okay. to support them with if we lose these if we lose restaurants that's I mean there's they're the reason people come to downtown and they right. go to 26 and right. they're important for um, you know our community overall. Okay so from what I'm hearing from the board I am looking for a motion to approve the waiving of liquor licenses for the for 
uh, the calendar year 21 at 100% based on the information as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Great, thank you. Kinsman? Aye. Mignani? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Shear? And Greaves? Aye. Sh Rob, I saw your mouth go. You were muted, but that's okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, okay. I do have one question. Sure. Um, Aye. We, <laughs> we, we, we are talking about the uh, all alcohol restaurants, but there are other businesses in town that have like wine and malt rest, uh, businesses as well. Those are and here they, as well. So this is all restaurants. Uh, this is only restaurants. Just and restaurants only. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think our liquor stores have been impacted, Joe. If anything, they're probably doing a band of business. Um, kind of curious as to how that's how that's working out. But okay. I was just maybe we should we do for one, we should be able to do for the others as well. But well, I, I think to you know, to Beth's point, it's really our restaurants that have been impacted right they were closed down at first and then they were doing takeout and yes they were able to go to do outdoor dining but we know that's that's it's going to be tough i mean i know myself we've we've been maybe going out for lunch but it's getting cold at night oh yeah <laughs> now, i think restaurants as we said are uniquely hard hit and deserving yeah. of some consideration yeah. yeah maybe we should consider raising the fees for the liquor stores there we go <laughs> wow. beth you were about to say something no, I, th I think that's it. It's they, they depend on those liquor sales um, to really help keep the doors open. Um, so that's why I think they've been impacted the most. I mean, you can, sure, you can, you know, to have takeout alcohol now um, for the governor's order, but it's, it's not enough. It's not going right. to, just not going to reach that level that they need it to be at. Well, and not all of them are doing it, I don't think. True I mean, enough. I, have, yeah. I don't know. I haven't, you know, but. Right. It's true. You're right. So, Okay. Great, I'm gonna stop sharing again. Thank you all for that discussion. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Beth. Thanks for bringing that up, kiddo. Thanks for your support. They really, the business community really feels that and I really appreciate all you do. So thank you. Thank well, you. Again, thank you for bringing these kinds of programs and possibilities to us. So it's thank definitely you. a mutual, mutual benefit to all of us. Great, okay. Um, so we've done that, we've done that. So we've taken care of all of our old new business. We've done our consent agenda. It is 6.53, someone wanted to say something? Hey, Michael. To, uh, oh, hey, Michael. Um, we did add, I don't know if you wanna do it now, we did add the, the deed and easement under old new business. Yes, uh, let's do that now. Thank you for keeping me honest here. As I said to Susan, I was all set. I had been able to do a little stuff and then I came to sit down to for the meeting and all of a sudden I saw all these other things that I had to um, do. Okay, so we are, we have added the uh, finalization of the transaction with the Kennedys for a land taking that uh, Jen sent us this afternoon. Um, so this is for the trail easement. I was looking to see. Yeah, so this is for the trail easement that goes along their property. Uh, 24 Sudbury is the only place in which uh, the Riverwalk crosses over private property. Um, they had agreed to an easement um, and we were going to convey land, which we discussed in um, approved, at, I believe, the 2018 special town meeting. Um, and so we had to wait until the project was complete to to do a survey and do an A&R plan. And all of those things have been done. We're just in the process of sort of cleaning up um, some, some loose ends. Um, and this is one of those things. And so basically we need to just uh, vote to authorize the conveyance of that land and the acceptance of the easement. And then we can file that at the Registry of Deeds and, and be complete with that. Okay. Um, there is a, you know, we will be doing um, a slight amendment to the one that you have. Um, just if there was a issue with um, a, the call out on the plan. And so we will amend that. And I did check with town council that it was okay to, okay. to the authorization. Good. So board, we were emailed the copy of the deed, copy of the easement, and then a motion. Does anybody have any questions or comments on any of the documents that were emailed to us? No? Okay. 
Anybody feel like reading the motion? Otherwise I'll just do it, but no. <laughs> I can do it if you want. Okay, go ahead, Brandy. <laughs> Get some reading in. <laughs> there we go. I hereby move that the select board, FKA Board of Selectmen, convey the land shown as parcel G-1 on a certain plan entitled, quote, subdivision plan and easement plan 24 Sudbury Road, end quote, dated January 7th, 2020, prepared by Green International Affiliates, Inc., and recorded in the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds, Plan 400 of Book 2020, The Plan, to Kevin M. Kennedy and Amy B. Kennedy, and in exchange, therefore, accept an easement known as Parcel PE-1, permanent easement from Kevin M. Kennedy and Amy B. Kennedy, as all authorized by Articles 11 and 12 of the November 28, 2018 town meeting, and further to authorize the chair to execute and enter into any and all documents necessary to effectuate the conveyance and acceptance of said property, including execution of a deed and easement agreement. We can get a second. Steve, you're the only one on um, unmuted. Second, great, thank you. <laughs> we have a motion from Brandy and a second from Steve. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Kinsman? Aye. Mignani? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Shear? Aye. And Greaves? Aye. And that passes 5-0. Thank you, Jen and Michael, for bringing that forward. Um, I know there's other things that you're looking at, so we'll um, you know, be prepared to help clean stuff up. Okay. It is now 657. Um, I see Tom Powers. I see Craig Seymour. I'm not sure. Michael, do you know who else we're expecting? Rich is from, here. And Rich is here as well. Yeah, Rich, uh, Craig, Scott Richardson. I believe that's who we have for your team, right, Rich? Uh, oh, sorry, just unmuted. Um, Joe Antonellis was trying to get on. He was having some trouble. He just called me. Um, we definitely want him on. So give me a moment. Let me try to ring him up and see if he can get on again. You want to get me to, while he's doing that, just kind of introduce what we're talking about tonight? Sure, why don't you do that? So um, it was about a month ago, uh, Rich Gordon, who is the owner of the mill complex at 10 to 50 Main Street, I think the, um, the project is termed Ashland Mills. Um, he has proposed doing a development at that site, a redevelopment of the site. Um, it's a mixed use uh, residential with commercial um, project. Um, there's a lot of amenities around the site as well. Um, they are proposing to do it as a 40R district, which is a relatively rare, um, I think especially for towns type of smart growth district um, that's used in Massachusetts. Um, he presented his project, his initial plans to the board. Um, the board provided, I thought, some very consistent feedback with what you liked and did not like about the project. And um, so Mr. Gordon has with his team gone back to incorporate some of that feedback and present it to you tonight. I think I should just let everybody know, um, as this is a 40 yard district, it, it takes a town meeting vote. There are a lot of steps involved in this process. So I don't want people to think that we're you know, trying to uh, get this done like in the next couple of months. Um, that's virtually impossible. Um, this is a, a long process with a lot of dialogue between many different parties. So um, this is the second time that Rich has come before the board and it certainly won't be the last. So I think, Rich, have you been able to get uh, Joe on the line? Rich, you're still muted. Not quite sure. Okay, sorry. I have Joe on speakerphone. Um, and I also am trying to get Joe Sincata on here. So sorry, hold on one second. Uh, can I just add a, ask a question, uh, Mike or, um, or Madam Chair? Um, 
Is there a difference between this, the uh, material we were sent via email, I think today, and, and the material that's in the packet? I mean, should we be, we were sent something separately by, I think one of the project folks. And then there's a, there's a bunch of plans in our agenda packet, which are we gonna be looking at? I think both, Rob. Okay. So what you received before, um, that included just the layout and the design, some revised drawings. Um, again, these are just conceptual drawings. And um, what you received today was more of a summary sheet in terms of the unit okay. camera, square footage, um, and then also more of the economic impact. Um, oh, okay. So we should pull both those up. All right. Joe, you still can't get on? Oh, I'm still trying to get in. The password is so long and so many uppercase, lowercase. I'm just trying to make sure I got it right. And I think the last two are, letter, are numbers. Rich, he should just be able to go to the Ashland Mass website, go to the select board meeting and click the link and it should just let him in. And then once he's in the waiting room, we would admit him. That's the one I, of the easiest ways to get I'll in. Try, I'll try it off that, my phone. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair, would you like me to summarize some of the feedback the, the board gave while? Sure, we're getting go ahead. Um, so I think the first thing that everybody agreed on was that uh, the build, the mass of the buildings was overpowering, especially with four stories um, right um, up front, not directly abutting the street, but very close to the street. Um, the unit count that was proposed initially was 270 units. Um, I think we all fought, felt that that was um, too high uh, for the site. Um, one thing to note is Mr. Gordon is proposing to do 25% affordable. Um, as, these are as these are apartments, um, all of the units uh, would be able to count towards our affordable housing inventory. Um, the initial presentation had a commercial square footage of 20,000 square feet. Um, the board and I think the staff were concerned about um, the minimum amount of square feet um, compared to what the residential square footage was and also what the current commercial square footage is. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing that was, it's really hard to define is what do we do with our current businesses there, especially those that have made investments in into the property and uh, is there a way that they can be held harmless throughout this process? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, that, I think that summarizes it pretty well. So um, Rich, I'm not quite sure where we wanna go, but we certainly wanna get moving. Yes. Um, well, yeah, I, you can start can taking or someone likely. else from your team. Uh, there were a number of other uh, concerns okay, voiced, I mean, the scale and the number of units and okay. the overall okay. appearance. So I didn't want to add that. Rob, Rob, I covered those. Okay. The scale, the mass, the number of units, okay. 270. Right. Maybe, I'm sorry if I missed that. All right, so Joe um, is going to kind of kick things off for us. Um, so Joe, we have you on speaker and I'm just- Okay, I apologize. I, can, I ordinarily just can click right on. I forward the link to my uh, iPhone because that's where I do it from. Um, and it's just not, it's not letting me get through for some reason tonight. I don't we know. Are, we are are seeing, seeing him as a, as a participant. I'm seeing him anyway. Oh, you are? Yep. We let him into the waiting room and it says Joe Sincata. That's different. That, no, that's we're Wrong looking for Joe Anthony Ellis. Okay. Joe Sincata <laughs> should also be with us. There he is. Um, so, can you guys hear Joe Antonellis on my phone? Yep, it works. Okay. So, Joe, go ahead and go ahead and kick it off for us. Good evening, and I apologize for the inconvenience for all of us. I, this is the first time this has happened to me. Um, you know, we wanted to. We appreciate, first of all, appreciate uh, staff uh, helping us to get back on your agenda to provide you with the update. Uh, when we were in front of you on the uh, 1st of September, I believe it was, um, we spent a considerable amount of time going over the, uh, the, the, the uh, entire project. Uh, and, and, uh, and we included in that, I think, a very, very uh, thorough overview of, of not only the project, 
project itself, but the general 40B process that would provide the community with a significant amount of uh, both uh, incentives from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but also at the same time a very cooperative approach to uh, doing a project of this magnitude in a spot as important as this one is uh, to the overall Ashland community. And um, as you'll recall, when we came in, uh, we, we showed you a variety of architectural uh, photographs of, of the uh, projected uh, development, and we provided you with a significant amount of information relative to the manner in which the original, we had originally designed the project. Uh, I, uh, my main goal after I opened up and introduced everybody was to try and take very good notes, uh, and I think I did. And what you will see tonight from the team is a response to the comments, concerns, and suggestions that were made to us by each of the various members of the board and also by uh, your, your town manager uh, who provided us, again, with a very uh, a poignant summary of where he thought we needed to get going to and how best to get there. Um, so I think just with that very brief background, and I, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water because I'm not seeing any of you tonight, um, and again, I apologize. Um, I think it would probably be best if I pass the baton off uh, to Craig Seymour at this point and let Craig go through with you what we believe will be the initial financial impact on the town of Ashland by using the 40 approach. And if I said 40 earlier, then I apologize profusely. Uh, using the 40 hour approach, which again uh, is the smart growth statute in Massachusetts and does provide significant incentives. I would think at the same time, and again, I'm uh, uh, not to be repetitive, a little bit handicapped because I can't see what's going on. I believe that Scott Richardson has some plans for you to review that will show the uh, de uh, 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 some details of the buildings that have been changed. We've reduced the mass, uh, added some additional architectural features, and uh, reduced the size of the project uh, by uh, uh, 40 or so units. And uh, again, I'll let Craig go through that, and then I'll, I'll just sit back and again, try and take good notes. Uh, thank you for your patience with me tonight. Okay. And uh, I do have, uh, I have, this is Scott, sorry uh, to interrupt, but I, I would be sharing uh, Craig's uh, information as well as the uh, updated floor plans and site plans. So if I could be allowed to share, that would be great. Yep, look, working on that right now. Or Susan, if you could give him the ability to share, because I'm not seeing that I can do that. Probably have to make him a co-host. Can you make him a co-host? There we go. Okay. So Scott, you should now be able to share. Okay. I'll pull up uh, Craig's uh, page here. Everybody see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, Craig, you're on. might be muted. <laughs> Is he available? Hmm. He was a sec second. Yep, we're there not, he is. Yeah, we're not hearing you, Craig, though, unfortunately. Craig, you might still be muted. Yeah, he is. Yeah. No, he's shaking uh, his head oh. now. Hmm. We had that issue last time, I think. You might have to call in on your phone. Could someone other than Craig take us through this or? Well, I, I could. Scott, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you go run us through it and then you're going to sure. parlay right into your. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not hearing you, Craig. I'm seeing your mouth move, but. Yeah. We're not hearing you. So Scott, um, if you yeah. could take us through this, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, again, uh, the major, uh, some of the major changes in the overall design and massing of the project, you'll see further, but uh, in summary, we've reduced the residential units to 234 units and the commercial square footage has increased to 26,350. And that's actually, I think a net uh, number, not a uh, gross number. So. 
uh, we've made some adjustments there. Uh, also, we focused a lot of the commercial space in building number 50, since that is surrounded by uh, parking at grade. Uh, we felt that was a good uh, uh, mechanism to do that. Um, so again, the first uh, one-time revenues in the left-hand column here are building permits. Scott, can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can. Okay, good. Great. All right. So I'm back. You, I'm back. Why don't, you, why don't you take over here? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> architects talking about numbers is not a safe place to be. So let's uh, <laughs> I do me talking about architecture. <laughs> All right, well, you got to start it off. And th this is just a summary of the fiscal impact model that we've built for this that looks at the revenues that come into the town and any municipal service costs that are estimated that this will cost on an annual basis, as well as the one-time revenues that'll come in. Um, on a one-time revenue, when this gets built, building permits are $679,000 based upon our current estimates of what the construction costs are gonna be, as well as water and sewer hookups of $890,000. Now those go to the water sewer departments to the enterprise funds, but they are available for uh, improvements and to help those budgets within those funds. Over on the other side, we've got the municipal general fund revenues, and these are on an annual basis. So when this project, uh, as proposed now, is built, it's going to pay a little over a million dollars in taxes, and that's net of the roughly twenty-five thousand dollars a year a year of pays in taxes now. So it's a huge increase in terms of the revenues coming in. There's also we're estimating the people who own cars and register them there are going to pay some motor vehicle excise tax have conservatively estimated that about $36,000 a year. So a little over a million, million one in annual revenues. Now the municipal service costs, which we've done on looking at the per looking at the budgets of Ashland for those departments that will be incrementally uh, impacted by this. And that's primarily um, public safety, public works, and then education for the kids that come that will be living there. Police, fire, public works, these are all done on a per capita basis using standardized uh, methodology for fiscal impacts. Education, what we use is the, uh, the generation, the school age children generation that you're experiencing now at the Cirrus Apartments as a basis for that. And that comes out to be about $200,000 a year. Uh, that total is 450, so you're gonna net fiscal, positive fiscal impact of nearly $700,000 a year, $659,000 a year. The big variables there, of course, primarily are, is an education. If more children live there, you're gonna have more kids in the school. But even looking at some, and this we've taken a um, you know fairly conservative look at this, but even if you had twice as many children uh, and twice the cost, it's still going to be uh, very fiscally positive on, on, your, mm. on an annual basis. Now, Going back to what Michael indicated in terms of the 40R, the Smart Growth Program. This is a program in the state that's been used a number of times. Uh, it's, it's still something that is a little harder to get implemented because it does require new zoning in the town. The 40R Smart Growth uh, Zone is an overlay zone for a designated district that the town puts together that says, we anticipate growth is going to go on here, but we want to have some say on that growth and also benefit from the leverage that the 40R program brings to the community. Uh, it allows you to have higher density. It allows you to uh, mix, mix, have a mixed use development so that you have residential and commercial, but it also doesn't have to be one parcel specific. In fact, it can be a whole area like you have on your other overlay zones. And one of the things we'd have to sit down and, with staff to go over is just what should this district be? What should this district be comprised of? because there's an opportunity for future growth to also contribute uh, to some of the state incentives coming in. Key incentives here are financial for, from the state. So when you set up the district and it's approved by DHCD, you get a zoning incentive payment of $350,000 from the state. As building permits are issued, you get $3,000 per building permit. And that comes to the general fund with the restriction that these monies have to be used for capital improvements somewhere in the community, preferably within the 40R district, but not necessarily. It can be the, it can be the river walk, it can be sidewalks, it can be uh, water and sewer, uh, or it can be other, other uses for it. There are also a few other um, subtle benefits and incentives that go along with. One is, and this goes back to the annual, the school costs, is that there's a program, this is tied in with what's called a 40S 
Chapter 40S program, that there is a almost an insurance policy that if more kids come to live here and the school costs go up, the town is protected because those payments or a portion of those payments will be absorbed by the state. Um, it's done on, you know, once it happens, it's done on a, a much more detailed impact analysis to show exactly what those impacts are. You get a higher state match for any school buildings that you put up or any you know, monies that you borrow in the future to, uh, to build school buildings. There's a higher match for that. More importantly is you have favorable consideration on when, you're, when you're going for other types of uh, incentives or other kinds of, of aid from the government, from transportation, housing, and so on. For example, if, if there's a mass, a mass works grant that two years from now you're after to make an improvement in town, well, what this does, if you have a 40R district, it then moves you up to scale, the competitive scale in terms of being able to apply and get that grant. And um, it also gives you some protection against un for, uh, unfriendly 40Bs. So if someone else comes to town down the road, you have a 40R district, you have more leverage um, from the state's perspective in terms of being able to control or oversee or even deny in some cases that 40B. So those are the advantages of 40R smart growth program. It should be uh, part of the overall downtown Ashland planning process. You've got a couple of overlay districts now. You have the, the um, um, transit oriented districts. All of those really needs to, this is a good opportunity to really to refine those and make sure all of them are working together correctly in a way that maximizes the benefit for the, for the community. And this project um, can really serve as that catalyst for kicking that off because, you know, at least I think this team, I think we've, we've put together a project and, and Rich has put together a project that certainly is going to, uh, I think, be something everybody in town can be proud of. And at the same time, also, as you can see from the fiscal impact analysis that's on the screen there, um, it's not fiscally is a, ben is a big benefit to Ashland. So I'll leave it at that and, and Scott turn it over to you so you can show them the uh, the new diagrams, the new uh, pictures. Madam Chair, can I? Yep, ask yep. Before we before we go on to the diagrams, does anyone on the board have questions just regarding the fiscal impact that we've been shown? Steve, go ahead. Yep. Good. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I appreciate the way you've laid this out. Um, and I think you've, you've laid out certainly the potential benefits to the town very well. My question is why uh, is, is Rich and the team pursuing the 40R? Uh, you know, my reading of it is that there's not a whole lot of 40R projects uh, in the state, uh, and the barriers are pretty steep. You know, you have to be approved by the state, and then you've got to be approved at uh, a zoning change at town meeting with currently a, a two-thirds majority. So what is the incentive for uh, Ashland Mills to pursue a 40R. I'm not quite clear on that, uh, unless it's it's purely the the density capacity that uh, that's available. Um, I'll, I'll let Rich answer that, but what I want to say is a lot of it's right here on the screen. This is a big benefit financially to the community to do well, so. I get that. You've laid that out. I want to, um, my question is, why is, is Rich and the team pursuing a 40R? Why? You're not doing it purely to benefit Ashland here. So why a 40R process as opposed to you know, just a redevelopment project? Rich, you want to take a crack at that? Unmute yourself. You're muted, Rich. Okay, uh, Joe is going to comment first and then I'm happy to also share my thoughts on that as well. So go ahead, Joe. Oh, okay, uh, Joe Anthony Alves here. Thank you. Uh, when prospect of redeveloping the mills came up. We reviewed all of the possible options that are associated with the redevelopment of a site like that and concluded that the best avenue for a partnership in a town, in a spot in the town that we thought was as critical uh, as this is in the downtown area of Ashland, and the best way to approach it from the flexibility of the zoning to provide for multiple uses within the same building or same area and at the same time provide an economic incentive to the town of Ashland would be to go 
go through a 40 R. We felt that even if we were to construct carefully amendments to or some kind of modification of your present bylaws downtown, that a project of this scope and size could not have been built um, in, in, in any easier fashion than we're attempting to do with 40 R. And by doing it this way, again, we can, I, I'll use the phrase, sweeten the pot uh, for the town because, again, it provides these incentives that are still available. And you're correct, there are not a lot of 40 R developments in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And having spent the amount of time as a land use lawyer that I have, it's always surprised me that it's not used a little bit more. We felt that based on its location as close to the train station as it is, and because it was the redevelopment of a existing industrial slash re retail commercial center, that this was the best way to go. And, and we believe that. And I would piggyback on that um, as well as saying it is all of those reasons, but also I've owned the property for a long time. There's a lot of existing tenants that we would hope we could somehow try to work with and get them into the new space. Um, I see that Julie Z is on with us tonight. She's one of the people we'd like to talk to among others. We have had dialogue with the dentist um, and other people. Um, also, I just really felt that seeing a mixed use down there would just be, you know, very beneficial to the town. I did. Um, so other than that, there's no, you're right, Stephen, there's not <laughs> tons of incentive um, for us on our end, other than the zoning really, but it would just be great to see this type of a uh, use in the end versus just apartments or some very scaled back version of it. So I hope that answers your question, Steve. It does. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Madam Chair. Yep. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thank you. Uh, Craig, I'd like to thank you for the uh, presentation that you made on the financial economic impacts towards the town. I do have a couple of quick questions, though, with respect to uh, municipal service costs. And I'm kind of curious as to how you generated those figures that are uh, in parentheses that show a deficit uh, uh, with the police, fire, and, and the education. Specifically with the education, is how many students were you basing those figures on? Joe, thanks. That's a good question. Um, the police, fire, and public works, that's based upon the, we use a methodology that we, we look at the town's tax base and divide it between the residential base and the commercial base. And then we look at the uh, number of employees in the town for the commercial side and the number of housing units or number of, of, of population or actually number of households for the uh, commercial, for the uh, residential side. We look, then look at the projected population, a number of households, the 234 units, uh, and then divvy that up between the two of them. So on average, between the commercial side and the residential side, you know, this project on average would cost, based on, you know, last year's budget, it would be $114,000 in police services and so on. Again, these are average costs that we're looking at. Okay. On the education side, what we did is we looked at other uh, apartment complexes around and particularly paid attention to Cirrus up the road as a good example of that. Uh, and using the ratios of the number of students that are now coming out of Cirrus, uh, that worked out to be 23 school age children coming out of uh, this project. Now that that's, you can find other projects around that have more children. Many of them are in, in locations that are actually um, like in Lexington and uh, Newton and Arlington, um, a little bit different projects. And some of those are actually have a lot more two and three bedroom units and they're actually geared towards families more than anything else. Uh, they have playgrounds and those kinds of things. We see this as much more of, a, of a, an urban project, urban looking project as an old, uh, you know, redevelopment of a mill that's gonna be attractive to young professionals who don't have kids and to empty nesters primarily. There will be kids, we know that, there always is. Uh, but with a mix of a few studios, a lot of wet lot, one bedroom and only and a relatively few, relative few number of two bedroom units, which, you know, based upon the market demand, uh, we think, uh, figure this is a pretty reasonable number for it. Okay, did you, in your uh, calculations, did you ever think of uh, calculating into 
the, the folks that move in with children. And, you know, if there is a, a small number, have you ever thought of the idea of the potential of special ed children moving yes. in? We've included that cost that. is ex extremely higher than, than the standard. Yes, we've actually included that in our calculations. Uh, what we do is we look at the school budget in detail and we don't include the ones that are fixed, like the, the um, administration costs. They're not going to change for 23 new kids, but the number of teachers are, the teacher support, mm -hmm. all of the, the pupil support, and the, and the budget that goes into uh, special needs and special ed, uh, and all and that, that's a $2 million budget in its own right, that does get included in this on a per capita or per student basis. So we have taken that into account on a proportional, proportional basis. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm good, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Madam Mike, Chair. Yep, Rob, go ahead. And then I know Michael had some questions. Yeah, just a quick question. So I would, uh, this looks like a, a good analysis, but I would um, ask that it be confirmed by our own staff and someone, I don't know if Michael, if you've had a chance to review this or our plans to confirm their numbers. I mean, we spent a lot of time discussing developing our own fiscal impact analysis for projects. So I, I'd hope we'd uh, you know review these numbers and and know what we're and be able to confirm them. Well, I think to that point, Rob, I would ask that our planning department put this through our own fiscal impact uh, tool that we have. Sounds good. Um, Michael? Well, I mean, I'm going to suggest. I actually think it's probably if we use our own fiscal impact tool to you know check these numbers. I'm going to assume they're going to come out pretty close because Craig actually developed our fiscal impact tool. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, I didn't want to say it, Mike. Uh, if, you, if you actually remember, I do um, remember that. Yeah. Sears, you know, when the Sears development was going through, one of the things that the board required was a fiscal impact tool. Right. And, and um, so Campanelli Thorndike is, um, they actually retained Craig and, and RKG to do that. So you might, it would be hard to make the connection. I did not connect the name. So yeah. Um, but that does bring up a point I want to maybe mention later. But Craig, so how many students do you have um, currently in the school system that reside at Cirrus right now? I'd have to go back and check the numbers. I don't have them in front of me. Uh, what we we're working off of is uh, we don't have the, the current as of this year number. Uh, we had it from, I think, the beginning of last year based upon the number of units that were complete, completed and occupied at that time. That, and as soon as I can get that number through the school district, we can update that and refine that if we see what's different. I don't know if there's any more kids or less kids than there were before, but we're using it on when they were about two thirds of the way completed and uh, occupied is the number, the data that we got from them. Okay, um, just a couple of other things. So the other municipal services that you have, police and fire, mm -hmm. I assume you're just in public works, you're just taking the um, the figure from maybe the Schedule A, something at DOR, like the per capita figure maybe, and adding that, is that? No, we're, no, we're take it, we take it from the official budget number for the last fiscal year, or from your, your reported financial analysis, yeah. divide it by the, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complex than dividing simply by the number of, of the residents or the number of households, because we divide it up between the, the commercial side and the, which is about, I forget in town, it's like five, four or 5% of your, of your tax base is commercial. So we assign that on the number of employees that there are in town on a per employee basis. And then we take the rest of it, the 90 something percent, which is residential and divide it by the number of households to get a per household cost for each of the line items that we consider to be variable costs with an incremental, small incremental increase in the number of households. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it is, it's a pretty complex formula. I know, I know that you use it. One thing is with the 40 yard stuff and the incentive payments and the bonus payments, um, you know, unfortunately we do have a track record in the state of, um, you know, the state incentivizing us to move to different things with the promise of you know, significant state money. But oftentimes that money gets eroded over time. A um, couple mm -hmm. of examples, EPA initially starts out as 100% reimbursement. Now we're around 2025. Who knows what it's going to be like now that Boston is part of the CPA process. Think of things like the Quinn bill. Um, at one point, 
the state covered half the cost of education incentive payments for our police officers. Um, when the financial crisis hit in 2008, 2009, that went away and towns were required to carry the full load. So how confident are you that this, this funding is gonna be there from the state? You know, Mike, that's a really good point. Right now, all of us, you know, the uncertainty that we're facing both from the, the government side as well as from the private business side is, you know, paramount right now. We really don't know what the future holds, but all we can, we can, the only assumption we can really make that things are going to continue more or like, less like they have in the past. I do know that housing is still the governor's highest priority. In fact, I was listening earlier today, he was out in Western, oh, there was a Western Massachusetts uh, economic development conference that he was a keynote speaker on. And 80% of his entire speech was about the need for more housing in the state and how the government need, and how the state government and his administration is going to continue to keep, keep pushing that. So, you know, that's where the wave, that's where the, 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 the force is being pushed in that direction, continuing to be pushed in that direction. And they're looking at programs that they have like 40R, which is actually, that's a cutting edge program. There's very, very few states around the country, a good deal around the country that have something as innovative of that. And so they're trying to get as much attention into that and, and trying to fund it and looking for success stories. They've had kind of a mixed success because of it's either been used by the big sophisticated cities or towns that have the capacity and, and the ability to do this. But a lot of the smaller communities like Ashland have not really taken advantage of this. Um, and they're looking for, they're looking for uh, examples of where this can be successful so that they can go out and continue to, to, to sell the program um, and their programs further on. So I'm pretty optimistic that the program is going to be there and the money is going to be there. What the legislature is going to do, what the other pressures against the state budget is going to come, I can't answer that, but I think it's along, you can just lump it in with everything else that risks that, you know, particularly the communities, municipalities are facing in terms of the budget risks that the state money may or may not be as great as they want it to be. Could be greater for all we know, depending on what happens at the federal level. And then what, one last thing for right now is um, I assume we're going to start talking about economics regarding the mixture of residential versus commercial square feet. Yeah, I think as we start looking at the, arch the architecture revisions, I think I know for myself, that's one of the discussions I want to talk about is the commercial versus the residential. Okay, so I'll hold off until yep. then. Thanks. I have uh, before we move on, I, I do have one follow-up question on, on the education service costs. Um, I know you had said you had looked at um, comparatively the, the Cirrus apartments and how many school-aged children were in Cirrus. I'm curious, and I don't know the answer to this, which is why I'm asking, how many two-bedroom apartments are in the Cirrus complex? Because I think that, you know, I was looking at your plans and there's 76 two-bedrooms that are planned. So I was curious how that compares to Cirrus. Again, Brandy, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I do know that their ratio of two bedrooms to one bedroom is greater than the, the ratio that we're using in ours. So they'll have, they'll have more two bedrooms, in fact, coming in. Okay, all right, that's helpful, thank you. So this this parcel will have more two bedrooms or Cirrus has more so two Cirrus bedrooms? Cirrus has more two bedrooms. And their ratio of two bedrooms to one bedrooms is greater than the- Is higher, okay. Higher than one we have that we're using. Okay. Any other questions on this? Otherwise we'll uh, go through the revised renderings. If we Spot, you're on. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, again, everybody is very familiar with the location that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> and what it looks like currently. Uh, again, you do have about 80,000 square feet of uh, surface area covered in buildings. Uh, and interestingly, with our new development, that is actually the footprint, approximately this, the footprint that we are proposing um, in that we are not extending as far as these buildings and we do have space in between our buildings that are pretty much covered with uh, uh, space for the lower levels. Um, so again, the existing basement is I think about 80,000 square feet here or, or lot coverage of the buildings. 
and our actual building footprints uh, in the new scheme total about 74,000. So again, the scheme is similar as you've seen in the past. We have the five buildings uh, marching down uh, Main Street. Um, these two are in the same location as the current buildings. The other ones are spread a little bit further apart uh, to accommodate the parking requirements and also the dimensions of the building. Uh, again, we have uh, uh, proposed that the main entrance and exit into the podium parking area is controlled by this uh, light uh, at Main Street and Pleasant Street. Uh, it is offset a little bit, so I've had some discussions with Lloyd, uh, uh, the traffic consultant, about what needs to happen as far as delayed uh, signaling and so on to control the traffic and make it safe. Uh, one thing that we, sorry, did not get to change here, uh, this will only be a one way in. So as you're coming either north or south on Main Street, you'll be able to enter here, but we will not allow any exiting here. Uh, be, and again, that may be controlled during uh, uh, rush hour times because the traffic again lines up here quite a bit to the light. So trying to exit here would be a, would be problematic. Um, so again, generally the scheme is the same. We have this uh, podium uh, parking that is essentially at the same level of Main Street. Um, and again, the major change here is we've devoted the first floor, all the first floor of 50 uh, to commercial use. Um, in that it, it, it has the prime access uh, parking on both sides and uh, would, would again be an attractive uh, location for uh, retail and commercial use. So we took uh, some uh, feedback from you relative to the concept of what is the massing on Main Street. So we're looking at, again, all buildings have two stories in the front. Uh, and then they step back so that the third floor on all buildings is set back about 15 feet. And then the fourth floor is also set back another 15 feet. So the, uh, the facade that you will see along Main Street will only be two stories. Um, unfortunately, uh, this building uh, didn't comply with our uh, <laughs> revised design requests, but in the concept, again, the number 50 does also have the uh, third floor step back as well. Again, this is the view from the south heading towards the uh, traffic light. Hey, Scott, I think it's important too, just to make sure people understand these are just, you know, fairly rough sketches of what it might look like. It tries, we're trying to put a little texture against it to make it look more realistic, but this is obviously not the final architectural plans. And there's gonna be lots of room for that discussion in the various permitting stages that this will go through in order to, to make this not only comply from a design perspective, mm -hmm. uh, but also to make sure that everybody's happy with the ultimate uh, you know, look and feel of the building. Correct, yeah, the, again, these are very conceptual uh, again, to get the general uh, shape and massing of the buildings uh, coordinated. Uh, but again, there's a lot of uh, more, a lot more design work that needs to happen in order to uh, present these buildings as the, the way we would like to see them. Again, this is number 50. Um, and it basically, I think the next rendering is a little more helpful. Um, Basically, we do have uh, this whole first floor of 50 would be retail uh, and commercial space. It's also recessed, so we have a wider sidewalk here. Again, a little anomaly here is that there would be sidewalk continuing all along 50 and parking all around 50 to provide access to the stores, shops, or offices that would be there. And again, this we would not be exiting uh, onto uh, Main Street from this entrance or exit. Out the back again, between uh, 40 and 50, we come out uh, on the podium uh, parking, we go around and then we also have a ramp down to the lower level and all, are, all underneath the uh, buildings 
uh, is devoted to parking. So the bulk of our parking is under the under the buildings. Again, conceptually, this isn't. 100% accurate, but again, conceptually, there is that uh, existing wall along the back of the building. We would be doing a river walk there, and then it, it slopes down to the uh, to the river, to the Sudbury River. Uh, we moved the pool uh, up to the roof, so that has access uh, for all uh, unit owners. Uh, and there's uh, lockers, showers, restrooms on this level and then the level below it has a fitness center and uh, some common uh, facilities. Again, conceptually at the street, we have two stories. Uh, the third floor steps back about 15 feet and then the second floor, I'm sorry, the top floor, fourth floor also steps back. Again, conceptually, the lowest level, the basement level is uh, significant uh, parking. So again, this is kind of a major change. I think at one point we had units in here. Uh, so, and, and again, we had retail and commercial all of in first uh, floor of number 10. So what we're looking at is again, maintaining the uh, wall, if you will, of retail office all along Main Street in all buildings. Uh, and then converting uh, all of 50 to retail and office use. Um, again, and it's also uh, surrounded by parking on, uh, on the three sides. Um, again, as we mentioned, the tally of units is 234 total. Uh, there are right now five studio apartments, 153 one bedroom and 76 uh, two bedroom units for a total of 234. And again, we have about 26,000 square feet of net of uh, commercial space. And again, it's all primarily on this main level, the first floor, accessible off Main Street. Uh, really quick How many apartments are there on the fourth floor? And I'm sorry, on what? How many apartments on the fourth floor total? On the fourth floor of the complete fourth floor of all buildings? Yes. Uh, one moment. Uh, 56 on the fourth floor. Thank you. And uh, what is the, the height up to the, the... So I believe we are uh, 44 feet. Um, hold on. For some reason, I can't get to this other first other direction. I think it's 11, it's always, it's 11 feet floor to floor. I could be mistaken. Uh, 42 feet to the roof. So again, the roof level for, um, from the street is 22. Uh, so every, every floor is about 11 feet, if you will. Okay, thank you. And one last question, and this goes to the, the description of the and I would call this the, the south end of the complex where you, you're having a one-way. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, uh, Steve, Steve, it's hard to hear you. All right, let me see if I can. A little closer to your microphone. So uh, this goes back to your discussion of the entrance or exit on the south side of the complex that you uh, yes. was one way. So making a left turn off of Main Street into that. What do you perceive to be? Well, that is a discussion. I think Lloyd is still working out the, uh, I don't, again, anybody that really wants to enter this complex, uh, either coming across Main Street or from, from Pleasant Street, you know, would not, would not bypass this entrance. This would be your primary entrance because this is signalized. So you'd want to enter here. 
if you're going anywhere here or going down to lower parking. As you came up here, again, this would not, I would assume there would be a no left turn sign here. Yeah. Um, so this is primarily for cars coming north um, to enter only. Um, and again, anybody else coming from the north going south would enter here. Okay. So we've had a, quite a long discussion on that. And uh, unfortunately, again, we didn't get a chance to update this and, you know, in his traffic report, he's going to be talking about how, you know, the optimum uh, uh, operation and signalization would, would work. But uh, we all know there is quite a bit of traffic, you know, on Main Street uh, during rush hour. So uh, we have to make, take that into you know, account. Thank you. Yep. Uh, let's see. Ah. Okay, for some reason, let me move this, if I can move this over or not. Or can everybody see the whole thing? There we go. Okay. All right, where were we? Um, so again, every floor, uh, again, this is the second floor. It's the same footprint and the front uh, for each uh, building. Uh, and then around the back of the buildings, we are able to connect uh, uh, 30 and 40 and 40 and 50. Uh, again, on the third floor, we step back all the units. So there are actually common outdoor uh, deck areas and potentially some common areas on some of the buildings. On the third floor, uh, again, we have what in, in building 40, because the pool is above here, this would just be mechanical space. We are devoted some space to fitness and purpose uh, space. And again, this uh, steps back again. So there's some common uh, outdoor areas on the fourth floor. And then up on the roof of number 40 is the, the rooftop pool with uh, support facilities, two stairs down and an elevator. Again, typical unit configurations. Uh, Again, work in process, just uh, obviously at this point, we confirming that we can in fact fit this many units in, uh, in the building. Questions on uh, any of this? Sure. Madam Chair? Yep, right. go ahead, Rob. Um, just a couple, uh, yeah, a couple questions. One is, um, and I don't think you uh, discussed this much in your initial presentation, but Many cases when old mill buildings are renovated, they're renovated rather than demolished. Um, and in looking at these buildings, I note, for example, the, the two stone buildings on the left, which I would think most people would think are the most emblematic and attractive. You're, if I understand this right, are replacing them with two buildings in a similar position. Did you consider preserving and renovating those buildings or? What was the calculus uh, that went into basically demolishing the entire complex and replacing it as opposed to renovating some of it? Like those two stone buildings you're showing look fairly sizable for the lot and potentially usable. Um, I think yes. that would go. Yep. So I'm just wondering what your, your thinking was on um, renovation versus demolition of. Um, the complex. Sure. So again, as you point out, uh, you know, 10, 20 and 30 are kind of the most uh, recognizable and uh, um, complementary buildings relative to the design and appearance. However, uh, the more we looked at them and the footprint and the more we talked with uh, some contractors on the reuse and renovation of those spaces, um, the more difficult uh, we were encountering trying to do that. So what, what we're looking at is primarily preserving the facades of these two buildings uh, back to maybe 30, 40, 50 feet, and then building on top of them. But essentially because of the floor elevations and the construction that's existing and what we're trying to build on top of it, 
uh, we would be pretty much uh, demolishing all of the upper floors as well as all the structure on the inside and building that all new. Um, it's a matter of what feasibly works to accommodate a standard uh, footprint, uh, standard uh, floor to ceiling height, uh, and just the constructability of systems. Um, again, we had started off, again, kind of trying to maintain the footprint as well as the, uh, you know, the, the openings in the, in the stone, uh, the granite building. Uh, but again, they're not as conducive to a, the apartment layouts that we're looking at. So unfortunately, again, we will be sa salvaging the fa facades, modifying them a little bit, and the returns, uh, again, as I said, upwards of 30, 40, 50 okay. feet, and then the rest is, re is constructed new. Right, and one thing um, I think I would, in terms of people come, you know, in terms of the current view and what the new development would look like, I mean, you might, you know, it'd be good if you could consider keeping that, maybe that at two stories and, and moving up gradually with the other buildings into more the the three and four stories and give people a bit of a transition as they come around the corner and, and kind of mimic to some extent the old project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, that was the thinking to you know really maintain kind of that two story uh, facade mm -hmm. along Main Street here. Yeah. Uh, in fact, again, we have some other renderings that show more of the adjacent buildings. Uh, across the street, uh, so that we're being a little more sympathetic to the massing there. But we felt that it was reasonable to develop kind of the same rhythm and concept for each of the buildings, given that we're stepping back and visually you would be, you know, really just seeing the two stories. So yeah, that, that was another thing I was going to ask because they're very uniform in height. Did you, and you think that's better than having varying heights or keeping that kind of variety? I guess that's um, that was another comment I had. You, I well, mean, again, I guess I'd reiterate that this is very conceptual yeah. at this point. Um, so there might be some opportunity to uh, to do that. Right. Certainly. Yep. And the, the the plan that you presented tonight in terms of square footage is it the same as the previous plan or did you reduce the actual square footage as well as the residential units? It's it's essentially, it's about the same square foot. I think we were always talking about something that was about 300,000 square feet. That's generally about where this is still. It's, it's a little smaller because of the setbacks off the street. That's reduced the footprint. Right. Oh, so I see. Okay. Each of, the, each of the floors gets a little smaller as it goes up. Okay. Yeah, I think, I'm sorry. I think were we about 320,000? I forget. I don't have the old numbers in front of me. So it, it sounds like, uh, based on people's comments, you you reduced residential, increased commercial, which I think, you know, right. is, is fine. But I think people were also looking for an overall decrease in mass and size. And maybe one way of getting that is that kind of gradual transition to four stories rather than everything being at four stories. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know, my my two cents on that it's sure. it still looks very large and i think you'll have people looking at it that way so um the yep. um but i do you know i do support the concept of the 40r and i can see the benefits of it i think it's just a question of uh, striking the right balance both um you know visually and uh impact in terms of traffic and things like that which will i'm sure we'll get to as we get into the project the traffic impact which i think is going to be very important for downtown but I think one of the things people are going to be looking at really kind of viscerally is what is the visual impact of this development downtown and how does it square with what was there before? And I think uh, I think that's going to be important to the ultimate success or acceptance of the project. Very good comments. And I think uh, as we move further in, I think having uh, similar views of the existing buildings and the proposed buildings will be helpful uh, for that. We've also entertained the idea of doing a, a larger scale site model, a physical model that would show these buildings in context with the, uh, with the area. Mm. And that's also a very helpful tool to aid in visualiz visualization of, that, of this. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Scott, did you have more that you were going to present? Otherwise, I'm going to open it up to the other board members for comments on the, that, the that, changes that you've yep. made. That is the extent of it. The only other document that I, I think you did get or is the summary of units and the square footages. So yep. we don't necessarily have to look at that. That's something for- uh, Yeah, why don't you put the visualization back up and I'm gonna open it up to other board members for their comments. Brandy? Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I do appreciate the, the decrease in the units and the setbacks that you have provided. I, I think I agree with Rob in, in the fact that I think if we could shrink the actual footprint of the, the mass, I think that would be a huge benefit. Um, I was also curious um, about the 42 feet in height, a four story building. Um, you know, I know you had mentioned, you know, how it compares to uh, downtown. And I was just curious as to how much taller this building would be from other buildings that we currently have in downtown. And maybe that's more of a question for Michael than, than um, unless you guys have happened to have that information handy. Uh, we don't, but that is also, also a good uh, exercise to uh, develop, again, a, a, an elevation of Main Street and designate the uh, existing heights of buildings and what we're proposing. And again, keep in mind, we're not proposing a full four stories of height right on Main Street. So, but uh, we, uh, we can definitely look at um, developing the information that relative to what's existing and what we're proposing. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And then I just had a, I just had a clarifying question on the, the square footage. Um, I know Yolanda has some questions on the, the commercial as well, but I just, the proposal that you had come to us before a month ago had 10% commercial and 90% residential. And it seems from your spreadsheet that you sent, it's now 11% commercial and 89% residential. Is that correct? That's what the numbers are saying at this point, yes. Okay, so this, from a square footage perspective, that hasn't shifted quite a bit. Um, it hasn't, except again, when you're talking about this size of a project, uh, 1% is, uh, or 1 or 2% is quite a bit of square footage. So, um, but again, we are up around 26,000 plus square feet of, of commercial space. Uh, again, very accessible from the parking and from Main Street. Um, okay. So, yeah. And then my final question was just, um, you know, the impact on businesses. And if you've um, started to have discussions with current business owners and what your, what your plan is temporarily and permanently for these, these businesses. Yeah, that would be something Rich would address. So we have not had a lot of discussions as of yet because it's so early in the game. And um, obviously we don't want to send off alarms to tenants that they're going to be getting kicked out of the building because that's a long way off if it even happens at all. So um, I've got to be careful with, you know, how that part is handled. Um, I will tell you that one of our, we have two, you know, major anchors, the, the gym and the dentist and I have had conversations with them and they are interested in working something out to stay on into the new building. And obviously we would have to, you know, find homes for them during construction and work them back into the building at some point. Um, it is conversation that we will be having with all of our significant tenants who some of them are online tonight. Um, but again, it's just so early in the process. Um, we know that this is not a quick, fast moving thing. So again, I, I have to handle it delicately. Um, and while I'm on, I would also like to bring up, um, there's been a lot of um, conversation about the massing of the building and the size. Um, so Scott had mentioned that we might want to pursue doing a model. Um, I also want to do that um, just so you guys know, it's very expensive to do that, um, to put a significant model of the building together also you know, tying in the buildings around it, which would give everybody a really good tangible sense of the size and how it fits in with the surroundings. Um, I don't want to do that just yet until 
we feel that maybe we're getting comfortable with where everybody would like to see this as far as final shape and size. Um, but I think maybe over the course of the next couple meetings, if we can get to that point, um, I'm going to plan on investing in building um, a model of the whole thing. And, you know, maybe we could leave it like in the center of town hall and people can go by and see it. Um, but I think that would be really important visually because it's very hard to really judge this just by looking at the blueprints now. It, it really takes it out of perspective. So two things I wanted to comment on. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I mean, I think, you know, this is a really important parcel for us in downtown Ashland. And I think that, you know, it's important that we get this right. Um, you know, it, it's it's not a secret that, that this project is, is, is being discussed. So um, I think that it's, it's a good process that we're going through. I support a 40R process because I think that it does bring the town some, some benefits that the A40B project wouldn't. But I do think that it's going to be um, a challenge to, to get this approved from a zoning perspective. Um, you know, if, if we present the, you know, the project as I'm, as I'm looking at it and I see that, that the number of units have been reduced, which is, which again, we're moving in the right direction but I'm still seeing the mass being so, um, what I feel probably is out of scale with, with what downtown um, kind of, you know, is, is, is and will be, um, you know, I think it's going to be a hard sell. So, you know, it's, it's my advice to you to see if we can reduce the scale of it a little bit more um, because I think that that's, the more we reduce it, the, the, the more likely that residents will see it as, a, as an improvement to downtown, which I really do think that um, this project would be. So that's just my comment. So, but thank you very much. Okay. Well, it's a great point, Brandy. And um, you know, the, the big thing that drives that is there is a formula and uh, we now have construction costs pretty locked down. We've gotten two quotes from two major general contractors we know for sure roughly what this is going to entail financially to build this. And there is, you know, as I said, a formula between how many units you can do and still make it fiscally, um, you know, fit. And we have, we really don't want to do this, you know, come back and forth and, and adjust little amounts every time, which is why we made a pretty big jump here. And we've gone from 270 something to 234. Um, we've increased the size of the mixed use, but the problem becomes that we still, I still would like to have this be a 25% affordable housing situation. And if we go smaller on the units, if we go smaller in the footprint, we are at the tipping point right now where we would have to come back and say, well, we could do that, but we can't offer 25% anymore. Um, so we really want to max out the affordable aspect of it. It's important to my team. Um, so if that can be done, that's our goal. Thank you. Okay. That's all. Steve or Joe, thoughts or comments that you'd like to give or questions that you'd like to ask? Thank, uh, I do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, I, I appreciate the... Uh, the information that you provided and you're sharpening your pencils. I still think that you could sharpen your pencils a little bit more when it comes to the number of units uh, and, and throwing out the, you know, the, that you won't be able to do 25% that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't jive by me. Uh, but that's me personally. Um, I don't like being put in a corner. So, um, and looking at this design that you have, Ashland has the downtown district uh, sub area A for mixed use and dwelling designs. Have you folks looked at that and tried to put to scale uh, the designs of your buildings, of those new buildings, to any of the uh, replications that have been uh, encouraged by the streetscape uh, facade and topographies that the town is uh, looking for? So that would be my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have looked at that. Um, and obviously it bears more analysis now that we're kind of marching down this conceptual path. So we will be um, taking a closer look at your recommendations and overlay concepts, as well as the massing that, again, you've done a 
a good job in putting this uh, bylaw together. So now that we're kind of here, we will uh, take a very, very close look at that. At this point. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. I yeah. appreciate that. And the current the current height of the the buildings that are here right now. What what is what are the what's the average height for those uh, buildings right now? I know they're not forty. That's a good question. Um, we will find out. Okay. The only reason why I ask that is sometimes when you conceptualize the height of what you're showing us on screen and what we currently have and trying to, you know, maybe maybe to do uh, something that other developers have in the past and the UGC has done that, uh, maybe do a balloon test to show the actual height and what it would look like in the downtown area. Maybe something for a visual uh, grasp so, so people can get an idea of what that, that height requirement or what that height would look like uh, in that area. Just, just a suggestion or a thought, guys. It's a good, it's a good suggestion, and again, we can verify kind of the existing heights uh, pretty, pretty easily. So we'll, we'll get that information together. Okay. And my last, my last con, uh, question and concern is, is the intersection and um, some of the issues that I, that I see with respect to uh, turning right and or left coming from, coming from Myrtle Street, which would be be hitting south on uh, Myrtle onto Maine. Uh, there would be a no left turn sign, I would assume, going into that location. So how would those people have to go down and around through the uh, downtown area to, to swing back up to come that way? Or would they be able to turn left onto the Myrtle Street exit way and they could have that access into the into the back area of that building? Um, let's see. Let me pull up the site plan because I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. So the exit that you have in the rear exit of, uh, of the building that's closer to the Myrtle Street uh, area. Okay, yep, oops, sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, I'm Back I'm here. Okay, okay. Yes. yeah, that, that's perfect. So would they, instead of having to go all the way down and turn and they wouldn't be able to, would they be able to use this as an entryway to come into the, to the, to that complex that way? Yes, so we are going to be regrading this, uh, but this would still be this. This will be an entrance and an exit, which then gets you to the lower level. Okay, and that was one of the questions that I had to you folks earlier mm -hmm. on your first presentation, because the uh, the grade there is really steep. Yes, uh, would be you would be raising that to somewhat of a level. Of, uh, yeah, so that that hasn't been worked out. But what I envision and what we've had discussions on is you'll probably have this as a ramped entrance right here. Yep. And you wouldn't be able to drive to here if you can see my, my little- No, I can't. Yep. yep. So this would be, again, a better ramped entrance up to here so you have much better visibility. Okay. But this, this has still always been planned as an entrance and an exit. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, thanks. Yep. No further questions, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, Steve? Any? You're muted. You're muted, Steve. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, yeah. And Scott answered a few of my questions earlier, but I, I wanted to respond to, you know, some of the comments that Rich had made because I, I really, you know, I appreciate what he said in terms of, you know, we don't want this to become an exercise in futility for for Rich and his team coming back before us, uh, you know, on a semi-regular basis and, and tweaking this. So, you know, I think. For me, I'd like to see, and it goes to some of the comments that Rob had, had mentioned earlier about uh, about the massing of the buildings, and and maybe some some ways we can um, we can reduce that. Um, I was going to suggest that uh, you know the potential to remove the fourth floors uh, might be uh, a, a an option. I don't think that's that's totally an option, but maybe that's an option with some of the buildings rather than across the board. If, if you were to remove the fourth floor on all the buildings, certainly would have a, a, a major impact on the, on the look, the massing of, 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 the, of the property. Um, yes, it would eliminate, uh, you know, 56 apartments, but it would still be well in excess of the minimum density for a 40R. Uh, so that's, I, I, 
throw that out as 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 some way, some mechanism to you know the next time we meet that we you know kind of look at how we can further reduce this uh, uh, the mass of the project. Uh, you know, I I'm as well uh, think that there's a lot of potential here for a 40R, um, but I think it really is going to require. Uh, a, a really strong support from from the select board to, to move that forward and and potentially uh, be successful at a town meeting. Um, but I preface that by saying I have a concern about the funding from the state as well. Michael mentioned this. I mean, this is this is really something that we see on a regular basis where the state develops programs and they don't they fund them initially and then. As time goes on, funding gets diverted. Funding uh, gets 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 diverted to some other need or use. So, you know that's that that's a concern. I mean, the carrot is awfully nice, but I think we need to really evaluate that uh, on our end at this point. So, th those are my my comments as as of right now. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so couple things. First of all, thank you for coming back and thank you for making the revisions that you have made. I think you have listened to the comments that we made at our first meeting and our first review of the project. I was happy to hear that you're looking to keep at least the facade of build of 10 and 20. Um, you know, understanding the structural impact and not being able to keep the, the all of it, I think is a little disappointing in regards to trying to maintain the historic buildings that are there. And, uh, but at least the if the facades can be kept. And I, I understand that, you know, what you're showing us is just renderings and they're just the initial. Um, I would say they, they almost look too generic. And I would say that go and look at our form-based code zoning information that's on our website through our planning board a lot of time and energy was put into that to to say okay yes we want to encourage redevelopment of properties i think that's important but it, it needs to be redevelopment that sort of fits the the feel of our community um certainly 234 apartments is better than the 280 um, I would match the concern that Steve had in that, you know, if we could remove that fourth floor, I know, you know, you're a developer and you want to be able to do it economically. And we certainly want to support you being able to do it economically. Um, but how can we find a balance? Um, you know, I think the affordable housing component is, is very important for our community. Being able to hit 25%, I think I, I applaud you for wanting to do that. And, and let's work together to try to keep that. And I would just ask that you not sort of, you know, threaten, I mean, and not that you did, but um, I understand from the economics, you, you know, you need to, if you're gonna develop this, you have a certain amount that you wanna make, you're a developer, that's what you do. But, you know, if there's a little, little give and take that could happen to maintain the 25%, and reduce the massing a little bit, as was said, you know, maybe not all the buildings look exactly the same from a height perspective or what's available. Uh, and I mean, I, I think 40R, you are correct. Our, as long as Governor Baker is our governor, he is going to encourage housing and construction of housing in this state because it has been shown that there's not enough housing and certainly not enough affordable housing. And a number of us, see that as important um, and and it varies within our community there are people who don't want more people living here in ashland they're like nope i moved in i i don't want any more or i moved in and there was a certain feel for this community so i don't want any more people uh, so i think we need to find that balance and work with that because as has been said this does have to go to special town meeting as of right now it does have to pass by a two-thirds majority and you're going to need our support. So, you know, that's why we're here listening and working and talking to you and asking, asking these sort of hard questions. 
um, for our community because they're not all available to come in and sit in a meeting like this. And then for me, the, the last comment and concern is the commercial aspect. Uh, I know that you have increased it a little bit from the last renderings and I, I appreciate that you've made all of unit 50 commercial on the first floor, um, except that what you're replacing, what, you know, what you're putting does not replace what you already have. And I think there are a number of businesses there that we want to try and keep in Ashland. And I, I hear you, Rich, that you're going to talk to the businesses that are there. And this is a beginning process. Um, but I would say if you could at all eke out even a little bit more commercial, I think that would be helpful. Because our, our community has always said we want to see redevelopment but we want to see more commercial. And I would say to lose commercial for this redevelopment, as a community, it means we're taking a step back. And I know, um, you know, it's been talked about how the redevelopment of this parcel was part of our MassWorks grant that we did a couple of years ago. And people are like, well, they must have known this was going to happen. I mean, anyone looking at those buildings knew that at some point, Rich, you were going to come and present redevelopment of those buildings. I mean, it makes sense. There's, they're old, they have, they have issues. The, the businesses that are in there are, you know, some of the office space is, is not as up to date. And, and certainly as a, as a landowner, you want to develop it and, and make it better and maybe improve the clientele that are in there. So I support that. And, um, you know, so, but it's been interesting and, you know, people have said, well, we knew this was coming and I'm like, oh, it's a land, it's, you own the land. Of course, you're going to want to improve it at some point. That's what you do. Um, I just think we need to keep the, the conversation going. And one of the things, one of the other developers that did that came to town was had a forum with the public. And some of that was not very positive for them but I think long-term it helped them create a better design. And I don't know what we have here for public tonight, but I'd certainly, um, if you're willing, uh, if we have people who want to give a few comments after Michael Herbert speaks, not for them to get into a debate with you, because I don't think that's appropriate, but just like you're hearing from the five of us and we are hearing from the public, if there are public who would be willing to give you some feedback, again, not for debate, not for discussion, but if there's feedback people want to give you, um, if you'd be open to that tonight, I, like I said, I don't know who we have on. Um, I don't know that we have a lot of people on, but I know we have a few. So I would say, you know, if we could, if there are a few people who'd be willing to participate, but I'm not seeing that many. So, but that would be something I would recommend, you know. And, and I don't think you need to put money into a, a scaled model yet, Rich. I don't think that's, as you said, I don't think we're quite there yet. And I think you can do a lot with 3D renderings that would help people observe this and see this. So, um, but yeah, so for me, it's it's that that commercial portion. I'd still like to see a little bit bigger if possible. And of course, I if the size were a little bit smaller, so. Sure, I appreciate what you're saying, Yolanda. And um, it is absolutely a lot of give and take. And under no circumstance was I trying to sound threatening with the 25%. My I appreciate that. I really want to get to 25% and, right. and do this with 25%. That's our goal. And, and we'd love to see that happen. And that was really my only point. Right. Um, and I think that you know we take everything you guys say very seriously. Obviously, we've come back and, and addressed hopefully everything that was brought up at the first meeting. Um, and yes, we expect the working dialogue and to keep this going and, you know, we're going to keep tweaking it and we will come back to you again with, um, you know, some changes with respect to comments that were made tonight. Great. Great. Michael, I know you had some more comments and or questions. Yeah, I just had a couple, a uh, couple of comments. Um, and, and actually some recommendations actually, uh, so first, Rich, um, you know, I appreciate the fact that you and your team have put a lot of work into this. Um, the 40R concept is a big risk for you. Um, I want to acknowledge that and say that, you know, we appreciate it. 
Um, I'm always kind of stuck in a weird role here because, you know, I know what the board wants and through the community and then, you know, what I think is important, but I always feel like when we're talking um, outside of a meeting, like it's not my role to push things down. I'm, I'm guiding and advising you and letting you know what I'm hearing, but, you know, it's your job to present and it's the board's job to, you know, provide feedback on what they like and what they don't like. Um, that being said, you know, I've been very clear with some of my comments with you. I think the commercial space is way too low. Um, I'm pushing for something around 40,000 square feet. I think Beth could be satisfied with something a little bit less, but, you know, I think she needs to have an opportunity to weigh in later on what she thinks that is. Um, we've talked before about the commercial to residential percentage being like 15% commercial. 85% um, residential. That seems to be the sweet spot that Urban Land Institute and the Technical Assistance Panel has said. Um, I realize that's a hardship because I forgot who mentioned it. Maybe it was Scott. Maybe it was Craig. 1% of this size of building is a lot of square footage. But there's two ways you can get to that 15%. You don't have to increase your commercial space that much. Um, you can also reduce the residential aspect as well and get your commercial percentage up that way as well. So a combination of both, I think, is your best bet. Mm -hmm. um, reducing the residential and increasing the commercial. You, I understand that it's an economic equation. I, and I get it. And I understand each individual developer has their own economics that they have to worry about in terms of financing. It's difficult to finance these types of projects. I want to acknowledge that. Um, but you know, instead of putting money into a model, I would, I would suggest if you're open to this, you know, we're going to have peer review processes, processes throughout this project, right? You know, depending on what stage. You know, you have done the smart thing by going out and, and hiring Craig, who's like the preeminent economic person in this, um, you know, in this in this area, right? Um, but I would propose, would you, would you be willing to put some money in a peer review account for us to hire our own economic consultant to do kind of our own independent analysis? Now realize that, you know, it's not a hard and fast number where you have to, you know, we can't say, oh, you can do well with a 15% return. Your financing might require a 20% return, but I think it would be really, really beneficial for us to have our own independent um, analysis being done by somebody in Craig's realm. So first, would you be willing to, to entertain that? Uh, yes, I, I'd be willing to entertain it. In fact, it's uh, come up in discussions with Peter and I once before. Um, is it possible, you know, if we open up that door to get some idea of possible budgets before, you know, we commit? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, understand it would be the board selection, you know, the board would choose who that, who that um, consultant would be. But, you know, we would definitely put together a budget, something that's reasonable. We realize you can't go throwing out 50 grand for something like this. And I totally get it. Um, the other thing, I know there's been a lot of talk about design and the height of the building. First of all, um, the height, just to give people a reference point, um, I believe 21 Main Street is 39 feet. I believe 128 Main Street is 40 feet. Now, only one foot difference, but I know, all the board members know, everybody in town knows the difference between those two buildings is dramatic. It's not just one foot. And it's all about the design and the architecture. So um, where we can have some problems though, is that a lot of people like to talk about design and, and, and get into design with regards to these buildings. The select board has a role since you're going to go through the 40R process. Planning board will eventually have to issue the special permit and then you have a design review board um, on, you know, on top of that. So um, I just want to make sure everybody's cognizant of that and I think we've got to think of a way to streamline that for the benefit of the town and then also the developer as well. So I'll, I'll be thinking about that. Um, you know, other than that, uh, 
again, with the 25% commercial, I've offered it before. We're willing to be creative in terms of financing. And I know we talked about maybe giving back some of the state incentives as a possibility. And I think you made a correct um, conclusion that that's probably going to be pretty messy, right, if, if we do that. But, you know, we do have funding available for affordable housing, you know, that maybe we can help. You know, if you have a gap that you need to close, maybe we can help find a way to close that gap. And um, like I said, I, I just want to make sure that you don't shut the door to that because that might that creative way to finance things might be the difference between getting a project approved and not getting a project approved. So um, that, those are really my comments and thoughts and suggestions. I appreciate that, Michael. Thank you. Okay, so did you have any other information you felt you needed to present, Rich or Scott? I don't. Okay, nope. Scott, if you would go ahead and stop sharing your screen right yep. now. Sure. That'd be great. Yep. And then I'm going to open this up. Um, I know we have Julie of Julie Z's Bread. Julie, I don't know if you wanted to give us any feedback or um, if we have other, if anyone would like to, this is not a discussion. This is not a debate. This is, if you just have some feedback for Rich, the developer, raise your hand in the, in the um, raise your hand using the raise your hand button. Um, over on the side, if you have it open of participants and then, uh, um, I will open it up. Mark, go ahead. You're still muted. There you go. Okay. Thank you. And um, I know, it's, yeah, discussions like this are not the subjects. I've been using the chat box, and I know that's not for record use in the minutes or anything, but those are my main opinions I put down there. But I'm I'm looking throughout the uh, throughout the times that um, we have the other developers here. I'm not going to debate. I'm not going to go negative or anything. I'm trying not to go negative. But I'm just saying for what Ashland needs for future economic development will, will help if there's less residents and more employees for a remarkable future in economics. And for the developer to come in and do residential and foolish and lot size and density problems and all that, I'm looking at this as a, um, it can be business and make action and helps them at the West Chamber of Commerce and uh, everybody else that's involved in economic to say Ashen is looking forward to get some sort of business in here. But for the developer to come in and to say where and how and all that stuff, and the people don't understand it, it's going to be tougher to be good about it if marketable businesses, professional and all that, that I put down in the chat box, future growth and all that is not really a true thing in their eyes, but it's, it's the people who graduate to state colleges and all that stuff, and, and uh, families who move in to have a job and live together and education is the school for growth all those numbers can be true if it actually happens so my, my my point is we need future business commercial small and trump and and um small office and business professional up to five people but those up to five can be a expansion and branch out to other bigger businesses that coordinate together Okay. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I see a hand from Catherine's iPad. Catherine, if you could just unmute yourself and then give us your full name, please. Catherine Jerzyk, 11 Rodman Road. Um, I want to thank the developers for the presentation. The, the one thing that I, I know, I work in construction, so I, I get that all of this is difficult when you're making decisions. But what I see us missing is like the scale a 40, a 40 R right is, is smart growth means you're, you're actually like containing the growth and you're not bringing more traffic. Right. So 
So this project clearly is because what it's missing is like people don't have to get in their cars to go shopping to the grocery store and stuff. And I, I'm just going to throw it out there that we're this project right now misses that opportunity. And I would love to see some more creative, like really do smart growth. That's something Ashland could really be proud of. And I know that would affect the scale, but if we're getting a scale, but we're getting something that really is 40 R meeting the intent, I think we could probably feel prouder of it than just a big project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? want to give feedback raise your hand or wave at me from your camera if you'd like to do that okay andrea green i see and then i have an iphone who i don't know but andrea go ahead unmute yourself and then go ahead andrea you are there you go wave at okay. me from your camera um, if you'd like andrea to do green, that uh, 66 okay. andrea, green, street. And andrea mute I your face the facebook that you're watching andrea go ahead unmute yourself and then go ahead andrea uh, okay i you are you, you, you might have to turn yeah. off the facebook andrea mute your face the facebook that you're watching andrea okay. go ahead unmute yourself and then go ahead andrea uh, Okay, I'm gonna to have to leave and come. Okay. <laughs> I have um, some a gentleman in a pink shirt with an eye under on the iPhone. Did you have something else to say? I don't see a name. You're muted. Joe. Oh, is that Joe? Oh, okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, that's me. Okay. <laughs> I, I finally got. I got in about five minutes after I stopped talking. So. <laughs> Thank Good. you. Good. Okay. I think um, Andrea's coming in on it. Yeah, there we go. There's Andrea again. Okay. I think we're, I don't think we have two channels going. No, now you're just perfect. Now you're just on the meeting. Okay. So Andrea Green, 66 Cross Street. Um, I find this project interesting. I have not been watching all of the presentations. So there might be something that you've gone over that I missed. Um, I do think that from the street level, even with the setbacks on the upper um, stories, that um, it will do something to um, make your feeling from the street seem like you are not as overwhelmed by a four-story building, but it won't do everything. And I do agree with looking into what it might take to um, eliminate the fourth story, um, or from a design point of view, um, look into um, what happens if you set back the higher stories at the street side and you can't deliver them out in the back so that you don't actually lose the units um, because you just won't see them from the street and they'll still be part of the building. Uh, it will just be a different way of designing that building. So obviously that might be very expensive or involved, but I think it might be uh, worth uh, looking into um, because I know as a town that as much as um, many of us support the redevelopment of downtown and doing it with an eye to not just how it fits now, but towards the future. Um, but I think that we have many people in town that are just going to um, look at this project and wonder what it's doing in downtown. And I think anything that can be done to make it feel smaller as well as be smaller um, will help get it passed um, at town meeting. And I do feel that um, because it's downtown, um, our downtown thrives on its commercial business. We definitely need to increase our commercial business. So anything that changes that proportion, like Michael mentioned, um, by either reducing units or increasing commercial uh, will help this project pass. I also think that, um, a lot of people don't realize how 
density in that spot is a good thing for town um, because it's close to the train station. There, there are many reasons why increasing density there for housing is a good thing for the town. And I think that that's just something that is gonna have to be communicated um, to the townspeople to get people uh, to embrace it um, and understand that the town might be um, taking in more tax uh, revenue um, because of that density in our downtown than we have been. So that can be a good thing. And I don't wanna go on and on forever here, um, but this is a project that as Brandy says, um, we need to get this right. Um, and we need to get it right with what's already there uh, and somehow make this fit. And I have all the faith in Scott as an architect and knowledgeable designer that if anybody can make this design fit into our town, you can, Scott. So go for it. Oh. Thank, Thank you, you, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, one last shot, if anyone else wants to say anything. Um, I'm not seeing Julie raise her hand, so I'm going to say no. Okay, I'm getting a no. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple, just a couple points just on what was said in regards to, you know, Catherine's uh, comment about smart growth. Um, I don't know, Rich, if you're the person, I believe at the last, at the first presentation, there was the comment that you would be offering possibly a shuttle from the apartments to the train station. Yes, that's correct. That's, that's our goal. Okay. Um, that, so would, as, that would be part of the project. So as a, as a, you know, smart growth in regards to having, having people near transit so that they don't have to take their cars. So that is part of that discussion. Um, the other thing is Michael mentioned our design review committee and our planning board. And I know you don't have to formally go to them yet, but Michael, um, you know, one of the things that has affected and impacted the length of our projects is that we wait for design review until they're halfway through our planning board process. And I'm wondering if this is a, a process, you know, Steve, you've talked about this where select board and planning and zoning and conservation, um, you know, maybe that dialogue needs to increase between those committees as this project is moving forward, even before, you know, the true permitting process. Because I, I truly believe that this is a project that if it's, as, as Andrea said, if we do this right, and as Brandy said, if we do this right, it could be a positive for Ashland. Um, so I want to, you know, see if we can improve some of our processes to make sure we do this right. Um, you know, there's also been conversation about, you know, our, our plans. And I was doing a little research before the meeting. We have had discussion about downtown and we have some tentative downtown plans and, and thoughts on our planning board site. So, you know, let's pull those in as we look at this and, and create the vision based on some of that dialogue that's already happened. So I think that's important. Michael, anything on that or we'll take it offline um, maybe. No, I, I, I do think the interesting thing about this project is that the select board has a unique role in the planning, I guess you could say the planning stages of this. Right. Um, so I don't know, like I said in my previous comments, I need to think about a, a way to, I, I think, offer a way to streamline the process to where it, it, it's beneficial for both the town and the developer. Right. You know, so it's, it's kind of streamlined. Because we all know that we benefit if a developer benefits typically, right? If they're willing to give back to the community and be a true community partner, um, that's important. Scott, mm -hmm. you had your hand. Sorry, Mike. Scott, you Richardson, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, again, I I did want to acknowledge that you guys have done a very great job in your zoning uh, overlay district, the uh, form based. Uh, uh, analysis and recommendations, and I don't, I don't want you to think that we are ignoring them. 
I think at this point, now that we're where we are, we can now take uh, a better look at those and implement. It'll be an easier tour to implement them at this point, since I think we're we're getting a little closer to um, understanding what may or may not be acceptable. Um, the other thing is, I just wanted to, to piggyback on the uh, shuttle bus. Uh, program. Uh, that is something that we've discussed uh, very much in depth with the uh, traffic consultant because, again, obviously, to some for somebody to get in their car at six o'clock in the morning and drive a half mile to the commuter lot doesn't make any sense at all. So that is a component that is being uh, analyzed in the traffic study as well. Great. So. Okay. Board members, if there's no other comments or feedback at this point, I'm going to say. Just, just a quick, Madam Chair, that just reminded yep. me um, when you guys do that traffic study, um, look at all, you just look at alternative modes such as bicycle and pedestrian routes. Make sure you covered that and come up with any recommendations that we should be doing downtown to fit with that whole mass transit or, or get people out of cars concept. Mm -hmm. Just a quick uh, reminder of that. Sure. Okay. Uh, Rich, thank you very much for coming and making these changes and having listened. Craig, thank you for your input. Scott as well. Joe and Joe, thank you as well. Um, we appreciate you, you coming back again tonight. Uh, Michael and I will be working with you to determine when will be the appropriate time to have you come back. Um, I'm not quite sure what the next couple of months are going to be bringing because we have other issues as its community, but certainly stay in touch with Michael and we will continue working with you to, to find the best thing for our community as well as for you. Sounds great, thank you. Appreciate You're very it. welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Okay, uh, we are moving on on our agenda. We're into our priority project update section. Michael, I'm gonna let you start. We'll start with the uh, public safety building. Okay. Um, so just a quick update for everybody. Um, at the last select board meeting, um, we had talked about the fact that we had not received permission from faculty real estate to actually apply for the notice of intent with the conservation commission that was necessary as part of the permitting process. Um, after that meeting, after the conservation commission meeting, um, we did get that permission, so we did file the notice of intent. Um, we met on Monday night with the Conservation Commission. The previous Thursday, we had actually received comments from DEP on our application, so not the CONCOM, but the Department of Environmental Protection at the state, taking some issue with uh, the offsite mitigation uh, strategies that we were going to utilize. So instead of trying to force it through and, you know, try to you know, force a round peg into a square hole. Um, what we decided to do is see if there were any other locations on site that we could utilize for mitigation. Um, and that's mitigation. If you need to fill in wetlands in one location, you need to replicate it in another location. So um, we got those comments on Thursday, Friday, our team, um, excellent team. I just can't say enough about HKT and PAR, uh, this group. Um, they had already located a couple of options on the gift parcel. Um, Lauren uh, Gluck, who's the wetland scientist, and I visited those sites on Saturday, um, felt that they were compatible sites. And so they actually worked over the weekend to put together uh, concept plans to present to the Conservation Commission, um, which they did on Monday night. The commission was very, very receptive, um, which I'm happy to say. And um, so we think there's going to be a site walk um, with the commission and the wetland scientists between now and the next conservation commission meeting. But hopefully if things go well, we'll be able to wrap it up by the next meeting, which is in early November. So that's a great, um, that's a, that's a great positive step. Um, I will point out though, we only received permission to file the notice of intent. We still have not received the deed from Fafford for this gift parcel. So um, we're quickly running out of time um, with regards to that. Uh, so we've sent a number of messages. You know, 
you know, I, I don't want to comment too much on it right now. It's just, we've got a gift agreement. We've out, we've done everything that's outlined in it. I really don't see any rationale why it's being held up right now. Um, any reasonable rationale. So I'll leave it that way. Um, and then Joe or Steve or Jen, did you have anything to add about some of the other aspects of the project? Uh, get everything on ahead. Um, I appreciate all the effort that Power has uh, done uh, with uh, getting this prepared uh, on a very short notice. And um, you know, having spoken to some of the uh, folks on the CONCOM after the meeting um, a day or two later, uh, they were pleased with the uh, potential of on site uh, mitigation uh, to um, wetland you know, uh, replication on, on, on the property as is and not someplace else. And that will definitely help uh, the project along. And, and at some point, um, I think uh, I, I think we need to have an executive session to discuss the other matter. I would agree, Joe. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as Michael mentioned, the quality of our consultants is, is really first rate. And I can't speak enough about, about the Power Corporation. Uh, you know, that this CONCOM meeting was, I think, a big leap forward uh, into a, in basically into a wall, which represents the lack of not having the deed at this point in time. So uh, that really is, is uh, our next big challenge. Um, and obviously, we need the deed, we need ownership of the property in order to ask the, the taxpayers to fund the project. So uh, to be determined, I guess. So, but I'm yeah. with Joe. I think it's something we need to uh, we need to go into exec and, and discuss. Yeah, I th I think just to add a little bit of color to that, I, I think it's important. Um, you know, we um, I, I do think we need to start looking at at other aspects of this. So, okay. So executive sessions forthcoming. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else on the public safety building, rail transit district, anything there? Uh, the rail transit district, um, we do have the lip letter in application or the letter that needs to be signed. Okay. Um, and, and move that forward. So we'll move that process forward. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that UGC has been, um, you know, it took, a, it took a while to get to, you know, an agreeable product for lack of a better term. Um, but I will say that they've been um, really good in working with us and kind of moving things forward. Um, and then when are they submitting to the planning board? And I'm hoping that the planning board has reviewed all the changes and updates that we've done so that when they do their process, um, you know, they're not asking for. Yeah, they would go to the ZBA, Yolanda. Okay, it's ZBA. Okay, perfect. So. I Great. think Tom has joined us. He has. I'm here. Hi, oh, Tom. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to add anything about the lip process or what's going on there? Otherwise, we're going to continue. But uh, the only thing I would say is we are excited to move forward, and we would like to expedite the uh, the you know the the support letters and get those in so that you know get them back signed so that we can get them to DHCD and get the process rolling. Um, honestly, we're going to chase the weather. Um, so the sooner we can get into, get the, the, D, the DHCD process started and then get to ZBA will be better for us. Um, okay. because, uh, as you all know, the Cirrus project, um, with in the soil conditions, um, we've done extensive studies on that with, uh, with Reed who did the work there. I don't know if that's a good fact or a bad fact, but we, we've done a lot of homework on that. And so erosion control management, et cetera, is important to you and us. Very. Uh, starting that process sooner than later will be very helpful. So, okay. um, Michael, anything you can do to help us with that, we would appreciate it. But um, we're we're on, we're on hold, waiting for you all to you know get us what we need. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Tom. Great. Um, on the rail transit district, Michael, have you heard anything from the YMCA on? We're there. I mean, I know they were focusing on finishing Framingham, and I'm sure with COVID, things are a little have changed for them. But 
you know, the, the last, um, you know, the last discussion I have had, um, they're still excited about the project, still, you know, wanting to move forward with the project. Um, obviously, this is not the best fundraising environment. Right. Obviously. Plus, that combined with the fact that they have really stepped up um, during this COVID pandemic to provide um, programs and services, especially child care services. Yeah. Um, for those that desperately need it, um, has, you know, all of our schedules have been shifted. Right. So, right. Know, okay. I was just time. wondering if you had heard anything because, okay. okay. Yeah, that's I know at some point they were planning to come and present the program ideas back to the community. And I know that was pre COVID as well. So they're probably, they're probably, that's probably on hold as well. Yeah. I, th at this point in time, okay. but I do, I mean, I do want to make sure that everybody knows that they're still excited and enthusiastic about the project. And, um, you know, just like our projects take a little longer than what we desire. <laughs> Um, as, as we all know, COVID is uh, throwing a wrench in many plans in how we and how we communicate with people. So, yeah. Okay. One other question on the rail transit district. While we're talking about it, um, has there been any an, any updates on the dog park? As you, you know, have we? I know they're probably still fundraising on their end. Yeah. Um, so I know that the application is being worked on, Jen. Uh, I think you're as usual point person on that. Um, but, you know, we did have to provide a map and, uh, you know, some acreage calculations and everything recently for the application. So that's, been, Jed, I don't know if you want to. Add yeah, so I think the committee is working on the layout. Um, so we provide the map and, and the information and then they can sort of lay out a conceptual plan. And then the town has to provide a letter basically saying that we commit to certain things. So we've done that, um, but we're working with the committee to sort of work that that through. It's an open grant process. And so it's not, there isn't a hard deadline for submittal. So, but they are working on it now. Yeah, it's a fluid process with the foundation is at, you know, as you submit, and if you don't get it the first time you can resubmit and stuff like that. So, okay. Yes, because now that you have a puppy, Brandy. I know. <laughs> And I live in a neighborhood of puppies and everyone's asking about the dog park. <laughs> tell them, tell them to donate. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Good. Um, anything else on the rail transit district? Not that I have. No. Okay. Then let's go to downtown. So downtown, first I'll start off with, um, you know, I think anybody who's had the chance to experience the river walk in the last couple of weeks, um, in all of its fall glory knows how much of uh, an amenity it has become and an attraction it's become for the town. Um, I did uh, one day a couple of weeks ago, I went on a late Sunday afternoon and there were probably about 10 people on the um, Ocean House side and there were others on the actual river walk. But, you know, I, I met a couple who had actually came from Medway to just for the bridge. They had heard about it and they wanted to see wow. it certainly having the effect that we had wanted. Nice. Um, so the downtown project itself, we have the contract squared away um, and that is being put together and will be signed either the end of this week or early next week. Um, this is important because we still hope to start work this, um, this fall. And so we're gonna be doing a lot of the undergrounding work as soon as possible. Um, so, be on the lookout for traffic, you know, traffic alerts, traffic discussions, um, talking about potential impacts of what that will be. Just so everybody knows the process is BSC. Um, our engineer will be meeting with um, DPW, and myself, other members of some staff, and um, also the contractor, which is Geocio, who if you wanna see some of their work, just go to Weston. Weston's doing the exact same project. Oh. And, um, it's exciting and frustrating at the same time. So I'm just preparing everybody. Hopefully it goes a little smoother. I was having to drive, I was driving in and out of Weston last fall, fall, when they were doing their projects, it was rough at times. Yeah. And, so. it's, <laughs> um, and it's just, that's yeah. you know, a little bit of pain to see the progress, yep. right? Yep. So right, Rob, when you're riding the bike, like you're trying to get extra mileage and stuff, you know, you got to push yourself. So. That's right. Yeah. I, I would say that 
<laughs> one of the things I, that Framingham has done well is every week they have an email about road work and road impact. Um, let's let's work with DPW and and the consultants and see if we can you know the more information people have, the better. If they can prepare and know and know that okay, my my drive through town is going to be impacted because of this, and I can maybe go around town and I'm aware of it. The more information people have about how they're going to be impacted, the easier these projects are going to go and the more appreciative and understanding people will be. I agree. I, I think we've got a little bit of experience now with the water project. Yes. You know, it, you know we started doing that and obviously it was a little clunky at first, um, but you know, we've smoothed out that process. So hopefully uh, we don't regress a bit when we initiate this new stage and uh, okay. we can pick up the ball where we left it. So. Okay, great. Uh, so moving on, Warren District and Valentine Estate, anything there? So on the Warren District, for the Warren Barn, um, we do have the final construction documents from CSS. Um, I can forward that to the board if you want to see. It's not much change from the last one. So okay. we do expect to be putting that out to bid very, very soon. Um, and hopefully we'll get uh, good bids in. Um, hopefully if the construction environment um, holds out the way that our project managers for some of the building projects are saying, we'll see some good pricing um, with the barn. So that'll be good. Uh, 433 Chestnut Street, the thing that's being worked on right now is a tri-party agreement between um, the town, FSU, and the buyer um, because of some land exchanges, also a drive. We're getting rid of the easement that allows FSU to utilize the current house driveway to get to the barn also building a driveway for them to access that. So um, that is being finalized and completed. And then right after that, the purchase and sale can be uh, drafted and executed. So okay. those are um, the updates on those two projects. Um, Valentine project, um, you know, I, I just, we're, we're, we've actually got an RFP out. Um, I'm a little bit just kind of at a loss for words simply because um, the amount of work that Jen, Beth, and the committee have done in like a month has been pretty astonishing um, to decide to go in this direction of an RFP, put something together, um, which includes things like draft historical deed restrictions, thing is, you know, it's not just the request for proposals, it's, it's all this other stuff, all this information. Um, that's out. We'll st we've got um, our marketing plan that we will be executing. Beth has put something together. Um, so you will see um, a lot about that RFP. And I will say that for, we have a, I think I've said this before, we have no shortage of great ideas um, here in Ashley. And what we do have a shortage of is people willing to invest their capital and put their yep. own risk into making some of these projects work. Now yep. we have some very good um, examples of that. Um, I can think of Blush Bouquet, you know, Lisa Churchill and Alan McIntosh, you know, lives in town, he's put a lot, um, just, just a couple of people um, who have, again, invested in the town and their businesses um, to the benefit of, of everybody, the town included. So people will have another chance to do that with this project as well. And I'm looking forward to a bunch of different proposals that we are going to have to agonizingly pour over before. <laughs> I know, Michael, with that last big windstorm, that hole in the roof is back that everyone can see. And of course, there's, there is um, not a shortage of comments. And, you know, so are, yeah. has that been covered again? And we're using a different technique. Okay. Um, the tarp has not worked and there's no there's a number of reasons actually the wood that you secure the tarp to has Itself rotted is damaged. so much it can't you can't get a good grab on it so okay. we're trying to do that the the main thing that we're really trying to focus on right now is fixing the foundation because of the barn of the barn yeah the roof is not you know we've had experts come out they say you know the roof the building collapsing from the roof is not that much of an issue um, the chestnut beams and everything, the, the structure there is sound. 
Um, but the foundation, everybody knows if your foundation is um, compromised. Bad foundation, nothing, nothing can stand on top of it. So, so that's what we're really focusing on. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, Quick question uh, back to the public safety building, Michael and Jen. When do we anticipate the uh, bids going on to the central register? Jen, that's you. Yeah. So we, um, we actually do, in fact, have to go back out for the pre-qualification for the elevators because we only got two and we got a ruling from the attorney general's office. So we're working um, with Vertex right now um, to do that. And then they were shooting for uh, the 27th, uh, 28th, so next Wednesday. Um, but that's maybe a moving target. So just based on this, so I can keep you guys posted, but we're still within the time frame that we were hoping to, um, to be. Hey, that's exciting. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about any of our priority projects? Okay. Moving on to town manager report, one item. Oh, you didn't get the last agenda? I thought I was looking at the last agenda. No, I, you... I added like five or six items on that. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I don't have that agenda, so. <laughs> Take a vote on that one. <laughs> um, so COVID. Um, well, um, it, all the predictions seem to be coming true. Um, we are you know, experiencing up, an uptick around the, you know, around the state. I think the last number I heard was we had 800 and something new positive cases. That might've been yesterday's news. We might be higher today. Um, as of yesterday, we had 22 positive cases in Ashland. Um, and that, um, you know, is an uptick. Again, they are concentrated in like pockets. So you don't see like this widespread infection, but it's something that we are um, keeping an eye on. Because of that, um, the one organized activity that we had planned for Halloween, which was the spooky walk on the river walk, um, we decided to cancel, um, which is disappointing on a number of different levels. It's disappointing for me just as much as and Beth and Jen, and, and I'm sure the board and Ashland Day Committee, uh, just as it, is, as it is for the kids. And um, so unfortunately, we're going to have to cancel that and look forward to next year. Um, in terms of trick-or-treating, again, I don't think we have any authority to uh, ban trick-or-treating. I don't know how you do that. Um, the Board of Health came to that same conclusion last night after doing some research. But I do think we should strongly advise against trick-or-treating um, and you know, letting people know that that is considered by the CDC a, a higher risk activity in terms of Halloween activities. So. Um, I don't know if the board members think otherwise. Um, How did the city of Worcester uh, ban? I mean, they, they came out with a, a, a citywide ban for Halloween. I yeah, mean, the city manager did that. And, and you can, you know, you can always ban things until they get challenged. Yeah. Um, so basically, yes. I, I don't know. I'm not of the mind to ban it. I can, I think we can you know, go the way of the Board of Health and say we discourage it. Um, but if community, if, you know, if neighborhoods have found a way to think, you know, that they can do it safely with people they know, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think people need to make that decision um, themselves. Just, before we get to whether we, I just, can we just discuss the issue a bit in terms of safety and why the CDC thinks that it's a dangerous activity, Michael? Do we have any? Well, they don't classify it as a dangerous activity, Rob. You know, they classify it as, as a higher risk activity. And it's just because you're in groups um, and you're going around to different households and, you know, they will likely be your neighbors and you might know them, but you don't necessarily know where. Yeah. So, well, I'm just thinking they're outside. I don't know, Did was there any discussion or, or thinking about maintaining social distance or mass to minimize risk? Or I guess I'm just thinking that, is it pretty much a consensus that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a risky activity and it should be discouraged however we decide we can do it or not do it? Um, is that pretty much a consensus and does everybody 
pretty much agree that it should, we should discourage it at least or take a position? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think to go to both Yolanda and your, your point, Rob, I think the, the, the best that we can do, I think, is to provide guidance. And um, should we discourage, uh, you know, I would discourage my demographic from participating in Halloween, you know, opening the door and interacting. Hmm. I think that would be a safe thing to encourage. Um, I would also encourage, you know, parents that think the right thing to do hmm. is to go through their neighborhoods to practice social distancing, to wear masks, and not to go into groups uh, within groups of, of, of kids. And, you know, I, I think that's the best we can do is encourage safe practices. And, you know, I don't know if we can, you know, how much more we can micromanage something like Halloween. Well, I guess that's my question is, but are there, so I think Michael was saying that we should advise against doing it, right? So that's, that's one position to take. Is there other things that we could present guidelines about how to do it or do something like trick-or-treating? I guess that's what I'm yeah. wondering about. Uh, I think people are looking for guidance. Um, the governor did. I think they are because they'll want to know if they go out trick-or-treating, are people going to answer the door? Uh, you know, that, well, or should I, you answer the door? I, I, would, I would say that, you know, similar to other years, if, if you personally do not want to participate, you don't turn your light on and you don't have candy outside, right? I mean, that that's always been part of it. If, sure. you, if, if you don't want to participate, if you don't want to be person handing out candy, you don't have your light on and you don't have candy. No, I understand that, Yolanda. I'm just saying, to what extent do we provide guidance and advice to people? And that's what I'm trying to... Rob, well, why don't we do that? We don't have to do... Post the guidance that the governor has put out. Right. There's no, there's guidance. guidance at the state level. And what, what is that guidance? Posted at, on our website. And, and, you know, uh, as opposed to the five of us, you know, making some kind of blanket, you know. Well, I'm sorry, you know, I guess I missed that. So what's the guidance in the short? Is it like don't trick or treat or? No. It gives, it gives suggestions like instead of having a bowl of candy, having a platter, um, making sure that people wear masks, not just costume masks, but masks um, underneath those masks, um, small groups, social distancing, you know, I, 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 I kind of fall more into that camp where we need to provide, provide that guidance. I think if we discourage trick or treating, I think it's going to force more people indoors. I, because they're, you know, I, I and I, and I've heard so many people that, that are not going to participate in Halloween, but it's, I think it, it becomes a comfort level and a choice. And I think if we, if we reiterate the state's guidance and, you know, we're not a red community. So, you know, I, I think I, I fall more into the, the, the camp that we need to, to help people do it safely if they're going to make that choice to do it. I just brought up the, I just brought up the, uh, the governor's the state guide. Yeah, I did as well. Oh, good. Share it on the screen, Yolanda, quickly. Sure, I can. It's already so posted on that, our website. I, I, oh. I was going to say we don't have to do one or the other. We can discourage people from doing trick or treating, but also have a message that says if you do choose to do trick or treating, and that's what we were going to do, is if you okay. do choose to do it, please, you know, utilize these guidelines from the CDC and then also from um, Mass DPH. It doesn't have to be a mutually exclusive thing. Right. So it's it's pretty straightforward as to what they're recommending. And of course, you know, mask, social distancing, washing your hands, sanitizer, you know, avoid, avoid indoor. So I, I think at this point, Michael, to your point, I think, you know, if they're already on the on the on our website, that's great. And then, you know, let people know they need to be smart about it. Well, we'll, we'll be sending something out, I think, very, very soon. Again, okay. we have some stuff on the website, but um, you know, I I think the board is actually saying the exact same thing with each other. I think there was just maybe this um, thought that if we discourage trick or treating, we just would 
basically saying that's it, you know, and, and, and offering nothing else. And we're trying to encourage that. common sense, and I'm not right. sure how effective exactly. we are doing that, <laughs> but that's what we're actually trying to do. Right. Yeah. So but common yeah. sense is not common, as my mom would say. <laughs> right. Right. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, if people are interested, it's mass.gov slash news uh, backslash Halloween dash Halloween during COVID-19. Pretty straightforward. So. All right. So, but I think we should be proactive with whatever, you know, if our advice is, if we have a consensus that our advice is, you know, um, that you should evaluate carefully whether you should do this or not, but if you do follow these guidelines, which there is some concrete things there, I like think, leaving things outside rather than open, you know, answering the door, which I think is, right. you know, if we think that's important, we should put some effort into getting that word out and saying we've taken at least that this is our advice well, and give people some guidance proactively. What was that, Steve? How about a reverse 911 call? The other, you know, we can ask, we can ask Jim to send stuff out to his school, to, to the schools for people that are involved in schools. Michael sends out his email, his weekly email. We can make sure it's included in that, you know, maybe through the senior center, they can send out information that way. We have ways of disseminating information oh, I think, um, yeah. in the town. So I think, you know, to Michael's point, use the, use the guidelines as recommended by the state and use your common sense and do what you think is right for you. Right, but I think we, sh I still think we should be proactive. I mean, I'm not saying like the city of Worcester decided that it was too dangerous and they took a formal stance to not do it. And I'm not saying we should I, do that, but we should speak out and give people guidance definitively. I, and I do like the idea of a reverse 911 just to call people's attention to it uh, for people who may not be hooked into all these other forms of communication. Actually, I was, I was kidding about that, Rob. I no. was going to say, I, I don't think we should send, I, I personally don't think we should set out a reverse 911. Yeah, we yeah. haven't done a reverse 911 on other issues and other critical things that have happened in this community. I think people yeah. that are, are looking at doing Halloween are probably tied into most of those other forms of communication. Well, I'm thinking about people who maybe don't have kids going out, but they're, they're in neighborhoods where kids will be coming. So what's our advice to them? I mean, you know. Decide for yourself. As as the guidelines from the state said, put it on right. a platter well, versus a well, bowl. I, put it, you I know. Think, I'm just pushing for a distinct statement, which I think we've kind of outlined it, but we should make some effort, make sure it gets out there using a variety of methods. And 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 take a position. Um, great on that, Rob. I, I think we yeah. have our position. So, Michael, right. I have a question. You mentioned about the increases in Ashland coming from pockets. What does that mean? Are we talking about the nursing homes? Or are we talking about neighborhoods? Are we talking about because that to me is where, where the real danger could be is is if there are parties getting hosted, Halloween parties as an example. Mm. Forget about going door to door collecting candy, but Halloween parties that are contained within a neighborhood. So yeah, I think probably the best way to, to describe that is, you know, you have the larger community, but then you have little communities within that. So, you know, maybe the youth sports community, if you have one person who has been infected um, and doesn't know it and, you know, goes and plays um, on a team and for, you know, for some reason, a couple of other people turn positive, you know, at that point, you've got three that are positive. Um, and well, like we use the number... 22 pockets that you're that we're experiencing right now um yeah i think you know there's some where they get discovered is also a little bit um it's a little bit amoeba like in terms of how like somebody might get tested at school or get tested from an experience at school and then if like for example if they're positive you might start tracing back and find well you know they might have been doing this activity with uh, some kids so then they might be in a different school right but some of those members that participated in in that activity might be as well so you know pockets is a good maybe not the best reference because it it almost implies like there's a definitive um, delineation or line um, but I guess 
I guess we're, we're finding common activities or some common areas, I think, where that's, where that's happening. Okay. So, um, um, and then, you know, I know we're not a red community now. Um, you know, if the trend continues, by the time we're at Halloween, I'm not necessarily sure where we would be. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I probably... You know, I probably could have avoided a lot of this discussion just by providing you with like what we were thinking about in terms of sending something out, just like a copy of the guidelines and stuff yeah. like that. So I apologize for that. No, no, that's not, no, I think it's important for us to have this discussion though. It's not just your decision, in my opinion. It's, it's for us as a board to discuss what our feelings are on it, so. Yeah, so, at least you could use that as a guideline, right? So here's the question, Brandy, being someone who has a teenager who I don't know if they still go trick or treating, um, but I'm sure you're connected a little bit with with families that are considering it. What are you hearing about it? So I have a 13 year old, so he he sees himself sort of on the border of too mm. too old for trick or treating. Right. Um, I think we're probably going to take a pass on Halloween this year for him. Um, I offered that if he wanted to go trick or treating in our neighborhood, which is fairly contained um, with a couple friends, that that would be okay with me. I would feel comfortable with that as long as they were all wearing masks. Um, I've heard sort of the gamut from parents. So I think that um, parents want to give their kids Halloween because, in, in some way, shape, or form, just because. It's an outdoor activity. Trick or treating is an outdoor activity, with and you know I I think it's it can be done in a safe way, and I think if people keep that in mind, which you know I'm hopeful that they will, yeah. But I you know I'm hearing parents that that don't want their kids to go out, and right. then I'm hearing parents that don't want to cancel Halloween. So right. I think it can be done safely. Yeah. I I actually had a conversation with someone who has kids at the Mendez and she said, I don't think a lot of families are talking about it because she said, usually by this time we're talking costumes. And she said, I think a lot of families are thinking, you know, let, as you said, let's pass on it this year, better to pass on it one year than deal with this whole COVID thing a lot longer. So I, I you know, I think we have people in town who have some common sense and, to make the right decisions. I think if we offer them these guidelines and, you know. So Jen, how are you handling uh, with Sam? Right, Jen has a young child. Oh, and Beth is on still too. Yeah, so Sam will be dressing up for sure. Um, our neighborhood is a big Halloween neighborhood. So depending on the crowds, we may just sort of stay. Our, our house is on a street with just four houses. Um, I'm lucky because Sam doesn't care about the candy. He previously had a million food allergies. So it's really never been about the candy. <laughs> Um, so I thought, you know, if he gets dressed up and he can sort of run around, he will be fine. So that's what we're going to do. Can you right. show how he's going to be dressed this year? Uh, he is going to be the uh, ghost of Christmas future or the Ooh. grim. Future. Yes. Very cool. Yes. Beth, I don't know if you're willing to chime in, but you're in a neighborhood. You have daughters who probably are still somewhat interested. You're muted still. I do, yeah. So my eleven year my eleven year old really wants to go out. Her and her friend want to be the the cast of Clueless, um, but yeah, they really do want to go out. And you know, and honestly, I I sat in on the board of health meeting last night, and they did um, talk about this quite extensively. And um, you know, they they put together a lot of safety protocols. Um, they were following the state guidelines as well. Um, I met with Ed and Ashley first thing this morning at 8 a.m. to put together a plan for communications to go out to everyone. So I think we do have a good handle on, you know, what the Board of Health said, and it's kind of exactly, it follows exactly what you have all said tonight, too. Um, so we're definitely on it, so we can hopefully get that out to the community. Great. So, so the Board of Health is, is doing their own statement, or is it the same as ours, or? Not really a statement. Um, more of like we're you know we're supportive of the state. Um, you well, know, what the I'm just doing. saying to Michael, we should probably coordinate that. I mean, I think we only need one one statement on this. I would think. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay. they were they were going to to match. They were going to what? The, the 
guidance and everything. Okay. Yeah, so just be coordinated. And I, I know Steve's call it brought up as a joke. I still think reverse 911 is a good method here because this is a widespread activity. And if we have a certain thing we want to impart, I would, you know, I would support that. But. Our COVID website um, webpage is up to date um, with those guidelines. And then we're working with Amy Childs. She actually had a laundry list of like really cute activities that you could do instead of trick-or-treating. Sure. Um, so we're gonna put some nice graphics together so we can actually give people some ideas of other things that they may be able to do safely as well. Okay. Beth, while you're, while you're here, I noticed there's twinkle lights at the corner spot. Yeah, that's um, what is that's that our um, public art installation for the Circle of Love. Oh, it's okay. going to be the Tunnel of Love. And all of those circles that the community did, we have about 100 of them, um, will be hanging um, inside the Tunnel of Love. And that's going to okay. open on the 25th of October. Um, it, well, I guess with all good, yeah, it, let's hope it does. Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> And it will be opening soon. It'll be there for the Diwali Festival, um, as well as the Greater Ashland Lions event that they're having with their pumpkins um, the Friday before Halloween. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it will la it will be up um, through the end of the year. So oh, we'll nice. get through, um, you know, the holidays. It will be a nice thing. It'll light up every night. Um, people can walk through at their leisure um, and see all the artwork. It's really impressive. It's nice, beautiful circles. It's really great how the community came together on that project. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I know, Michael, it's not on the agenda, but um, if you could give us an update on elections and early voting. Yeah, I, you know, this certainly has to be mentioned. Um, you know, our town clerk, Tara Ward, Cindy Livingstone, uh, a number of volunteers uh, have really worked hard to make things uh, successful. Um, so tonight we've got the, we've got the latest numbers. So, so far, um, We've increased um, the number of registered voters to over 12,000 as part of this process, which is great. Um, already 4,471 Ashland voters have voted. Um, Via so, early voting and mail-in? Yep, so we've had um, 1,214 early voting as of tonight by seven, and then the rest, um, you know, we've, we've mailed out almost 6,000 ballots, 3,257 have been returned so far. So, you know, definitely uh, seeing an increased turnout. Um, I did mention um, Cindy and Tara. There's one person that always needs to be highlighted, but um, sometimes I, I overlook her, and that's uh, Jean Delushery. So she is in that office a lot. She is doing a lot of work. Um, again, she's one of those quiet you know, people that sits in the back, you never know. I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody's ever uh, called Tara or Cindy quiet. You know, I say that with love in my heart. <laughs> I'm a not quiet person. Um, but, you know, she does a lot. Um, and we've had a ton of volunteers too. The community's really, really stepped up. So, and Jen's kind of been coordinating everything all behind the scenes too. So. I was going to ask, you're getting uh, volunteers, a younger set of volunteers. People are stepping up. Yeah, we, well, we actually have, I mean, two real, um, you know, stable volunteers in the office now for a while um, are, are young in their early 20s. And, um, you know, the others are, you know, a little bit more advanced. I'll say that, you know, I, I do not like to use the word old. Um, do you still need people, Michael, or are you guys all set? I think we're in, in decent shape, right, Jen? Okay. Yeah, I checked with Tara today and I think we're in decent shape for um, scheduling for early voting because um, it goes through the next week and then also for election, election day. day. Sounds like she's are you, are you said they were looking for some people for early voting for next week. So if people were interested, they, they have to fill out a quarry, but there's still some slots for next week if people oh. would like to volunteer. So are, and, we, pay, are we paying people or are we have volunteers say. and then we're still doing um, registrars on election day how's that oh we're, we're doing a, a mix it's a hybrid so you know we've got some paid volunteers some some unpaid that's great okay good any, any idea how many people are most people dropping off the ballots at town hall or are they mailing them in they're dropping them off yeah in the, in the box yeah the big expensive metal box that is secure yes very good and and just so that people understand, their ballots are not being tallied 
until election day. Correct? correct? Right. So it's not like we're going to have early numbers or results or anything like that. It's not going to be until election day that these ballots will be fed through the machines on election day. But okay. That is a good question because we do you know, machine fed counting, are we expecting, when are we expecting to be able to count and get results? Any idea? Um, well, I won't hold. close. Yeah, I mean. Um, Shortly after. Are you talking about just for Ashland? Yeah. Um, I would say it's probably gonna be later into the night, a little later than usual, but it Go depends ahead. on how much they can do during the day, right? So if they get a lot of people during election day, um, their ability to process the, the other ballots will be hindered. Um, you know, it's just really hard to, really hard to gauge. When you, know, you live in is. Massachusetts, it's, it's pretty much anticlimactic, isn't it? <laughs> well, I was thinking there are <laughs> the other, that's true. Think about I think there are, um, Karen there and, are those, those ballot questions. And, uh, Karen and Jack are running unopposed. Yeah. Um, Basically, Marky is running on a post. Well, how about hey, now? Choice. I think rank choice is an interesting thing. You know? Oh yeah, we're not. You know what? We're not having that discussion. No, not I, tonight. I, wasn't <laughs> were, but, but I think there will be some interesting results. I think, but maybe not. I don't know. Okay. On that note. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I just want to say thanks for all that effort because it is very important and yeah. quite a challenge. Okay. Uh, let's go board reports. We'll go alphabetically backwards. Rob, you get to go first. Okay. Um, the um, next week, I sent this out just recently to you guys, so I'm not expecting people have read it or not read it. But you know, I'm on the MMA policy committee, or uh, and we're going to meet to discuss uh, priorities for the 21-22 legislative session. So I'm just looking for any feedback or. Uh, suggestions is to, uh, and especially for Michael, there's two items that uh, she talked to us about. One is this culvert grants program, which apparently, um, so I don't know, it sounds like um, uh, it's to help rebuild infrastructure, culverts and small bridges, and there's some grants available. So I would just highlight that. I'm not, I don't know if we have plans to apply or have applied, but strikes me that our downtown culvert could be a good candidate for this sort of thing and take it off the capital plan maybe. But that seems to be a big a big program. Um, so I wanted to just highlight that. And, and um, the other thing is the chapter 90 amount, 300 million is what MMA is going to ask for, for I guess the 2122 legislative session. Michael, does that does that refer to just FY22 or is that two years worth of, of sessions? Usually the, legislative cycle, yeah, usually the legislative cycle can run two years. So like two years, a yeah. file, um, you know, it just it has a couple year cycle before it gets through. And so what do you think of that $300 million number, which I guess is pretty standard of what MMA wants? Do we all you know, think that's realistic and worth going for and recommending? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's something, Rob, you're exactly right. It's something that we ask for as a group of municipalities every year. Um, and uh, it does not seem to seem to get funded unless it, it's initiated by the governor. Um, you know, just to give an example to everybody who's watching, um, you know, we only get $450,000 a year in Chapter 90 funds to take care of our road infrastructure. So your gas tax, you know, all the money that you pay in gas tax and stuff, you know, that all goes and um, goes into that fund. We get $450,000 a year. Um, just to give a, an example of, to fully reconstruct one mile of road is about $1 million. So as you can see that that doesn't stretch too far. So the 300 million would boost that up by 50%. Um, obviously something is better than nothing, but you know, personally, you know, this is a whole other issue. I think we've got to look at the whole system of, uh, you know, state municipal partnerships in terms of taxes and revenue sharing, but we'll do what we can with what we got right now. Okay, well, thanks. and. Is there any idea that this culvert program, does that look promising? Are you guys aware of it or 
uh, it strikes me also we're spending a lot of money on stormwater or that's another big project of ours and maybe this will fit into that. Yeah, we'll look at that, Rob. When we looked at it before, um, it was really dedicated at that time for um, the, the ability, it was really more like a, a, a um, fish life and, and amphibious life and making sure that they could get from one yeah. into the other. We didn't have too much that would uh, you know, be applicable there. Um, but we can see if those guys. Yeah, a lot of it's resiliency and climate change. I think this downtown culvert of ours is maybe a prime candidate for that. But well, this so might. it's a good point. So just remember, as part of the downtown project, we are fixing the culvert. Oh, okay. So that's one thing. However, it doesn't prohibit us from from um, applying for more grant funding and using that as opposed to you know some of the other okay. locally appropriated funds that we have. All right. Thanks. Um, my other thing, did we ever, did that a letter from the, did the attorney general ever reply to our letter? Did anything happen since, since my conversation with them? Uh, she didn't get back to me, so I'm not sure. I guess I'll call her back and say, ask her what's going on with that. But I, I want to do that if they'd actually uh, replied. I don't think, I don't think they have, Rob. I'll, I'll okay. double check. I have not seen something, so I'll double check. And, the only other thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, and it happened a couple of weeks ago, was that cyber incident with the town of Franklin, where they paid out five hundred thousand dollars. And um, um, this cybersecurity seems to be more and more of an issue. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, uh, you know, bring that up uh, and remind people about that. And just, um, you know, and, and just are we, you know, and maybe direct this to Michael. Are we, you know? providing all sorts of cybersecurity and trying to stay up with, um, you know, what's going on. And did we review that incident and our own, you know, just kind of review our own systems uh, in light have of it. Have you been assigned your cybersecurity assignments through, through our IT and through the state? Yeah. Oh, are you asking me that? I'm asking everybody. Oh. I, I keep getting assignments from our oh. IT department that says, you have been assigned these cybersecurity assignments that you need to complete. Great. Uh, I don't recall getting any of those, so. <laughs> uh, Michael and or Jen, can we make sure the rest of the board is receiving those notifications? Yeah, absolutely. You know, to, um, to be fair, I think they can be easy to miss sometimes. Um, They're pretty persistent. They are pretty if persistent. If you don't do them, it says you need to do it by this date. Well, Paul, um, Paul uh, Carpenter has, this is a very serious issue for him. It has been for the last couple yeah. of years. So he's um, invested a lot in terms of you know, software training, um, not just for his staff, but for you know, the rest of the, of the staff members as well, and also boards and committees um, in ensuring that our systems are safe. And I believe we do have some insurance coverage for, for those losses as well. I have to double check. It's Michael, did you are you familiar with what happened in Franklin and what they did and what caused this? Uh, it wasn't clear from the newspaper what what went wrong. You know, I don't I don't understand as much of the technical details um, as somebody like Jen would, um, but we're just <laughs> laughing because my technical proficiency is not very good. But well, it's good to learn from other people's is, mistakes, so. Yeah, what happens is, you know, these people introduce viruses, um, a lot of times that lock up the system, the, the municipal systems, or even the private systems, if they go attack a, a private sector business. And um, so what happens is, is it's almost, they hold it for ransom, they say, you have to pay X amount of dollars, and then we'll release your data that you use to send out your tax bills to, you know, make sure you know, everything, you can issue permits and things like that. Yeah. I presume we have some sort of backup that we can re and, you know, spin back up, I think is what they call it, you know, your systems, but. Yeah. All right, yeah. I just wanted to bring that up as a reminder of all, these things seem to be happening a lot. It happened at our, at, at my agency as well. Um, so, and I know other places being held for ransom and things like that, so. Anyway, well, that's the, it. The biggest that's... thing, the biggest thing for all of us to be aware of is if you get an email and you're not sure what it is, don't open that, it. That and or work. if you open it, don't click on any of the links. Right. That's where you get in trouble. Exactly. For cybersecurity training. What was that? 
including the nope. one from the cybersecurity. No, not the one from the cybersecurity training. <laughs> Click on that and do that. I need to stop ignoring those emails. <laughs> yes, please well, do. It, you know, it's it not that difficult to take yourself through them. I yeah. think, you know, half hour, and I think I've gone through like two or three different sections already. So good, good reminder. I'll look out for it. Yeah, yeah. look for them and do them. Yep. All okay. Right. For me. Uh, Steve, you're next. All right. Just a, a couple, couple quick things. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge Community Media Day that occurred on October the 20th uh, yesterday. And uh, it celebrates, you know, local community uh, access and celebrates and promotes. I'm reading this a blurb from, from their website. Celebrates and promotes free speech and accessible media for all. And you know, I think for one thing, for me, I, I realized during this whole uh, pandemic uh, situation how uh, important the local community access has been for uh, uh, for the community and how it's kept people in touch. And so I, I, I've gained a much more of an appreciation for for WACA and for all the work that they do and all the potential they have for. Um, you know, keeping the, the, the community engaged and promoting all the things that we do within the town. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and, and obviously thank WACA for all the work they do to support local government as well as all the, the programs and, and functions that go on. So that's number one. Number two is I just on behalf of the board, I, Michael might have already gone off. I just wanted to extend best wishes and speak recovery to his better half. Uh, Beth, mm -hmm. say hi to Beth. Make sure Thank you. She's got our, our best wishes. No, she just made me dinner. That's why <laughs> I turned off my video. You made her make you dinner? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> she's doing well. Thank you very much. Great. Here. Uh, Make sure you, uh, and then the last thing, of course, is, is again, thank you to all of our first responders, uh, frontline workers that and that are out there day in and day out. And I include also the uh, the poll workers as well. So thank you to Tara, uh, to Cindy and Jean. Jean, uh, by the way, serves on the Council on Aging. Uh, really nice lady. So thank you to everybody, all the staff that, that are frontline uh, in support of our community. So yeah. that's, that's my tune. Great, thank you, Steve. Joe? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, everyone's gone above and beyond everything that they needed to do tonight. And I appreciate all the effort that everyone's done, uh, especially with the presentations that happened this evening. Um, public safety building is moving along. We just have that one big hurdle to get. And once we get that deed, that would be helpful. Um, I'd just like to pass along uh, the town's condolences to uh, two families in town. We have two uh, tragic uh, deaths in town. One is uh, a, a gentleman who has a uh, family of uh, five children and his wife, uh, Mr. Haleman. Oh, yeah. uh, God bless his soul. And um, uh, a townie who uh, was a few years behind me in school, but uh, he was big in heart, big in stature, but he had a kind heart. He had a quick whip. And um, we're going to miss him. Danny, uh, you'll be very, very, very missed uh, from a lot of us. And uh, my condolences go to uh, Amy and his daughter, Sydney. I know the services are going to be this Friday from 8.30 to 10.30 in uh, Hockington and Chesmore. And then St. John's uh, Mass, uh, I believe, at 11. So um, my condolences to all of them. And uh, I'm going to miss his quick whip and uh, his uh, great stories that he used to tell on Facebook. But uh, we, lost a, we lost a big guy. And... Uh, I'm just, I'm sorry for my friend. So that's about it for tonight. Thanks, Thank Joe. you, Joe. Brandy? Uh, great. Well, I have just a couple quick updates. Um, one about town meeting. Um, Adam Schuster, our moderator, uh, had a meeting last week with uh, Attorney Mead and Michael about some, some thoughts around town meeting. Uh, Lisa was gonna do some research and get back to him. And it looks like that's gonna happen this week, which will probably mean that we'll reconvene as a group next week. So I think by next week, we'll kind of have a better sense of where we're heading with town meeting and get a date. Cause I think those 
two things are, are really important. Um, so more to come on that and probably our next meeting will we'll have some, some definitive um, decisions made. Uh, the other thing I attended this uh, last week was um, WEMO, the Women Elected Municipal Officials, had a leadership conference and uh, Attorney General Maura Healy spoke at the keynote and she's great. She's, she's just fantastic. But one of the things that she was talking about that I was really interested in, she was talking about her Office of Community Engagement and that they've been doing a lot of virtual trainings for communities around the Commonwealth. And so I reached out to their, uh, their contact person, I'm waiting to hear back, to get kind of a, a menu of the types of trainings they've been doing. Uh, one of the things that, that she spoke specifically about was civil rights training. So it might be something as the, um, uh, our racial equity group kind of comes together with some recommendations, mm. we might be able to leverage some of the, um, the content and training coming out of um, Attorney General's office. So as soon as I get some more information on that, I'll, I'll pass that along. But I thought, you know, it might be a really good resource in this virtual environment to be able to, um, to leverage not just the civil rights, but possibly some other some additional things. Maybe, you know, we talk about cybersecurity, maybe there's some something that we can roll out to the public, that might just be a good way to remind people of safety precautions that they can take and, and things like that. They also do things like ID theft. So uh, more to come on that maybe, but um, I just wanted to throw that out to the group. So, and that's pretty much it for me. Great, thank you, Brandy. Yeah, I had been registered for the WeMo, and then with my flight schedule, I didn't get to sit in on it, but I hope to watch the recording of it because I think there was some good information shared. Um, tomorrow morning is a Metro West Regional Collaborative meeting. Uh, we are going to be hearing from Beth Reynolds regarding our economic development, as well as in uh, discussion amongst other members of the our, our collaborative. Um, and we'll be present. I'll be presenting the letter that we passed. Uh, I too want to share my condolences to Danny Shea's family. Um, I remember one of my first interactions with Dan was when I ran the first time for select board, and uh, it's it, it was interesting getting to know him a little bit. I didn't know him very well, but. So my condolences to him and, and to the other family who just lost lost their, their dad. Um, I actually have a proclamation that I'd like to read for National Media Day uh, in honor of WACA TV. And I will sign this and get this over to them. I had hoped to do it before yesterday, but as with so many things, it sort of got lost. Anyway, uh, I'm just gonna quickly read this. Whereas WACA-TV is extremely important to the Ashland community, and whereas WACA-TV has been able to make the necessary changes to provide valuable information to the community in a variety of ways, and whereas the organization is not exempt from having to face the many challenges this year has provided and given pandemic, and given the pandemic we find more community members have relied on WACA TV to keep them informed. And whereas WACA has played a vital role in the community, but given the current situation, the community has embraced programming, including town politics, sports, Super Bowl celebrations, graduation, and many virtual events and more. And whereas the celebration of Community Media Day gives us an opportunity to bring awareness to WACA TV, we all understand the importance of free speech and to have our voices heard. WACA TV provides the community with that outlet and we appreciate them for all they do for our community. Now, therefore, we the select board of the town of Ashland do hereby give our thanks to WACA TV in support of Community Media Day that was recognized nationally on Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. We proclaim Saturday, October 24th, 2020, WACA TV Day in Ashland and urge all residents to make known their appreciation for WACA TV and everyone that devotes their time to the organization. Um, a lot of people are involved in what's going on there, not only the staff that they have, but the kids that are out filming and so, so many people are supportive in the programs that get done there. So we are fortunate to have an organization like that in our community. Um, another uh, update, so there was a Mendez School Building Committee meeting last night. 
that process, uh, schematic design, will be moving forward. Uh, the next big impact for that committee is the town election and town meeting vote. We are in the process of getting information out to people. We're going to be having, we're going to be reaching out and hoping to have boards up at the library as well as at the community center and information so that if people have questions, they can reach out. We're also going to be scheduling at least one or two more forums um, to get questions answered for people. Uh, so those are the big things that the school building feasibility committee is working on. And I have nothing else. Um, I know Paul Kendall, you've been hanging out. Did you have anything you wanted to ask the board or were you just listening? No, nope, just listening. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Uh, with that, if there is nothing else, our next meeting now will not be until Wednesday, November 4th. And I will say this, we may not know who our next president is on November 4th. Um, oh. As I've said to many people, I think with mail-in ballots and voting and everything that's going on, I think we need to be prepared as a town, as a state and as a nation that with mail-in ballots and, and you know what's gonna happen, it, we may not know right away, so. We may though. We may. You're right, we may, but we may not. And I think we just need to be potentially prepared for that. So anyway, if there is nothing else, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. No, no one wants to leave. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. And a second. I'll second that. Great. Uh, let's roll call vote out. Kinsman. Aye. Mignani. Aye. Mitchell. Aye. Sheer. Aye. And Greaves. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael and your staff uh, for all that you do. And thank you for those who have watched and have listened. Remember, if you have anything you want to reach out to us, we are Board of Selectmen, no, select board at ashlandmass.com uh, for your feedback and input. Thank you all. Have a great night and we will see you on November 4th. Go out and vote, stay safe and stay healthy.